everybody out there, is everybody here? So there's, I thought maybe what we could talk for a few minutes is uh, new ideas and once they come about, uh, how the world can respond to them. And so there's an old saying that you know, everybody knows about how if you come up with a better mousetrap, what's the rest of the part of the, the quote? So if you build a better mousetrap, what happens? They beat a path to your door. So the whole world is supposed to beat a path to your door and because it's such a great idea. And so is that always true? Well, according to Edward de Bono in his book Eureka, and this is a great book. Um, I think it's out of print, but you can get it like on Amazon.com. And um, he, it, it was actually in 1974, so it was the history of the um, inventions from the wheel to the computer. But even though it sounds kind of old, his ideas are extremely valid even today and beyond. Because it's, it's not so much about the inventions, but how they came about the ideas, and also how did the world react to them. So this Edward de Bono says having a great idea isn't enough. The world necessarily will not be a, be a path to your door if you have a better mouth mouse trap. You have to have other things. So what else do you need besides a good idea? Good marketing. Good marketing. Lots of patience in terms of um, being patient because sometimes the world isn't ready for your idea. You have to have a lot of confidence in your idea because a lot of people have had great ideas in the world and then what happens is um, people say, or their bosses, or their PhD professor thesis um, mentors say, oh, that's a bad idea. That'll never work. And if you're not really confident in your idea, you might say, yeah, they're right. I guess it was kind of a stupid idea. And then a lot of people have forgotten their new ideas, and then later on, only to be rediscovered by other people. So, so what Edward de Bono says is having a new idea isn't good enough, you have to be able to keep convincing the world that it's a good idea for years and years and decades, sometimes even to the end of your life or even past your life, sometimes your students have to continue the idea because sometimes it takes a while for the world to catch up with your great idea. Hey. When I was like seven years old, I thought it would be amazing if you could just like stop the show that you're watching on TV in case you had to get up and use the bathroom or something. Just saying. But I was like seven. <laughs> well, see, you were ahead of your time, and the world had to take a while to catch up to that. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so the experts that study stuff like this have come with some kind of interesting ideas. They've said that. The other thing is, even though you have a good idea, and to you and to your followers and to your friends, it's, it's readily apparent that it's a great idea and you, you should implement it. But unfortunately, um, as the Bono says, the world and its very entrenched established ideas can sometimes be extremely resistant to new ideas for many reasons, for financial reasons, just because it's easy to keep doing the same old thing and change it. And embracing new is always more difficult because you have to learn. and and study. So there's many reasons why the world is resistant to our good ideas. And the trouble is, um, so, so when you have this great idea and you're getting good results and you want the whole world to know about it and they're shooting down your idea and you and your followers, you know, they're, nobody's implementing it. So what happens is a lot of times it makes us really kind of, well, we're impatient because we have like a great idea. So the trouble is then we get kind of, we get kind of frustrated with the people that are resisting our ideas. And it's kind of a slippery slope, but a lot of us, I know I've fallen into this many times, you have a good idea and people say no, and then you start criticizing them because you know you're right, and you know they're wrong, and then you're like, look, you guys are wrong. So then, so I, in the past I've emphasized to people how wrong they are for doing things, you know, the way that I don't think is right, but De Bono and others would probably say that, unfortunately, um, emphasizing how wrong the other people are, while um, it may seem like a good idea to do it. Unfortunately, it doesn't really help your cause. And rather, they would suggest that what you really have to do is spend your time not telling them how wrong they are, but talking about your right idea and saying why it's so right, and especially what's in it for the audience. So if you have a good idea, to let them know this is why it's good, because it's going to save you money, 
or it's going to be safe, or it's going to be save time, or it's going to help people, or it's sustainable, it's not going to damage the environment. So you have to concentrate on the benefits of the new idea is, is probably the way to go. And of course there's many um, examples of that in the world with all the new ideas and stuff. But finally, um, after many, many months or years or even centuries, if somebody really um, embraces your new idea, um, you might think, well, gee, I mean, maybe we'll get a Nobel Prize for that, or maybe I'll make a lot of money with my new idea, or, you know, maybe somebody's going to give me a pat on the back. But the idea is we probably shouldn't expect any accolades. Sometimes people with new ideas have gotten really rich and famous and, and, and all those good things, and sometimes they've been run out of town on a rail. So you might think that, you know, you're going to get a pat on the back, but, you know, don't expect it because you might not get it. So do it if you have a new idea and you want to implement it. Do it if you really think it's going to help people or you really think it's going to help the world or the environment. That's the main reason for doing it, not for getting your Nobel Prize. I mean, we would have an honor. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, like the number one honor. Yeah, not yeah. even just one town. Exactly. And on his grave, on his tombstone, he put uh, in Udalis in Vixi, which means I hope, or one translation of that is I hope I did not live in vain. It was like he wasn't sure with the world except when he had, you know, would it continue. Exactly. Yeah, so um, Tim's point is, is on Hahnemann and how on his tombstone it said something to the fact that, you know, I hope I have not lived in vain. Because even, even at the end of his life, he might have been saying, well, you know, I wonder if, you know, people are really embracing my ideas. I wonder if this was all in vain. So even greats like Hahnemann have had their moments of doubt, perhaps. This is such a great quote. The trouble was um, a friend of mine gave it to me about 20 years ago, and, um, and I couldn't find it online, so I had to kind of paraphrase it. So it's not an exact quote, but it's kind of a paraphrase. But there was a Michel de Montaigne, a philosopher um, from France in the 1800s. This is such a great idea, and it gives us some solace when you're trying to convince the world of your new idea, and they're just not getting it or they're opposing you. At least, you know, don't feel bad, because this is the way of the world. This is so cool. So, so Montaigne said, so if you tell somebody your new idea, and you're like, okay, here it is, the first thing they'll say is, that's not true. It's just, you know, basically, first the world will say, it's just not true. And then after many, many months or years, people have kind of, you know, thought about your idea, and then they say, well, it might be true. I mean, so even then, they're not really giving you any credit. They're like, eh, maybe it might be true. And then finally, after a lifetime of hard work, telling people how, good your ideas, finally the world will say, it is certainly true, but it's not new anymore. So, yeah, that's old hat. Yeah, yeah, everybody knows that's true. So, at, any, at each point, you know, they're not really giving any accolades. They're like, you know, they're kind of being dismissive. But I thought this was a really, because it really sums up a lot of times how the world embraces new ideas. Now, of course, there's lots and lots of um, Examples of great ideas and the struggle to get them across. And of course, like Tim said, well, look at Professor Hahnemann. I mean, that was the, the, the number one idea that we would think of. But even something as simple as hand washing, I mean, you know, who would think of doing a pelvic exam on a woman right before they get to deliver and not washing your hands? I mean, you know, you just wouldn't do that. And, and think of if you were going to do brain surgery on somebody, I mean, would you ever even consider not washing your hands? But, I mean, just, a, you know, just a short amount of time ago in the grand scheme of things, you know, Lister and Semmelweis, I mean, you know, Semmelweis literally was run out of town, and they basically, um, you know, hurt him professionally, and he had to go back to, where was it, Hungary, I think. And he died in insanity. Right, he died of like a, you know, like, like a broken heart and, and insanity and stuff like that. Lister, um, he, of course, he, he had a little happier ending, um, but... But even things like that, where you said, well, it's obvious. I mean, you know, I don't know. Oh, I didn't want to oh. interrupt you, but I have a comment. To yes, follow. yes, yes. I'm reading a book about um, endemic diseases and cholera. And, you know, they didn't believe at all, even until the late 1800s, that it had anything to do with clean water. They were drinking sewer water, and they believed it was a miasmic cause, even when they were finding the cholera. Bacilli and microscopes, they were denying it. It's the same what you're saying. And they couldn't believe that drinking water had anything to do with the spread of cholera. 
Isn't that great? So for the people in, in the webinar, um, Ananda, Dr. Kramer had a great, um, a great um, comment. She's reading a book and she was saying even in the late 1890s when they knew about germ theory and they knew about uh, bacillus um, causing cholera, that even then the people were dismissing it and saying well, it can't be. There's no way that you could be drinking like you know sewer water and that people are getting this cholera. And of course when you're caught up in like an old paradigm, I mean sometimes you just can't see the forest for the trees and it may seem simple for us to look back and say well how could they not know that but I mean our, our, what we need courage for now is to think like right now in 2016 what things are we doing wrong? You know, what cholera bacilli can't we see? And what drink? You know, the 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 drinking water and the you know, the sewer water. What kind of things are we thinking are perfectly normal? What we're doing in like a year, a hundred years from now, they're going to say, "Oh my goodness, how could they not see they're they're killing them or they're giving them cancer or whatever?" You know, so we're probably guilty of the same things. We just don't know because we don't have the you know the the gift of looking back in retrospect. But even the um, ophthalmoscope, this was interesting because I didn't know this before I read Damona's book. There was a really smart guy by the name of, um, I think it was Charles Babbage, and he wasn't a, a doctor, he wasn't an eye doctor, he was just a really smart person and he uh, was an inventor. And he did have a friend that was a surgeon and a physician back then, so he said, well, hey, you know what, I'm going to make something for my friend. And he called an ophthalmoscope. And you know, with the light and lenses, and he figured, hey, you know, I bet you my friend is really going to think this is cool. He's going to be able to look in people's eyes and see what diseases are in there because nobody's been able to do that yet. So he he gives him this. He didn't even charge him for it. He gave it to his friend, the surgeon. He said, look at this. And the surgeon looked at it, and you know, he's like, oh, that's kind of a cute little toy, and you know, put it on his shelf, and 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 he never did anything with it, and and nobody knew about Babbage and the ophthalmoscope. So that's another good point that DeBono brings up. You can have a great idea, but if there's not a chain of of people carrying the torch, you know, here, sir, so Babbage gives the torch to the um, surgeon, and the surgeon just drops the ball. And nobody heard about it until, um, independently, other people, many years later, um, also came up with the same idea of the ophthalmoscope. And so really, somebody else publicized it and stuff, but, um, Babbage was really the first person who did it. He just didn't get as much credit because, you know, they kind of dropped the ball. Fortunately, like Edward de Bono says, when the world is really, really ready for a new idea, um, eventually other people around the same time or maybe a few years later start independently, quote unquote, thinking of the same thing. So when it's in the common, when it's in the, the you know, the mind or whatever, when the time is right, other people. So uh, we'll get the idea. So even if, if Babbage's friend, the surgeon, drops the ball, don't worry because if, if the time is right, the idea will come out maybe in Japan or maybe in, in the Middle East or somewhere else. The idea will come out, but we, we have to do our part to kind of keep the chain going. But even like the computer, even the internet, I mean, think of for how many years the internet was just a tool of academics for communicating with each other and like, you know, the common man and woman didn't really use it. So it's taken many years for many of these things that we take every day. And this is just not a, a great thing, but um, it's kind of a nifty thing that we've done in dermatology. Um, so personally, I mean, I can really vouch for how long it takes for a new idea to, to take place and get ingrained. There was a guy by the name of Seiji Harada, he, or Harada, he was a professor of dermatology in the Nippon um, University School of Medicine, and um, so in um, Tokyo. So in the uh, late 1970s, he came up with this great idea. Like for years, people, when you did a candida skin test to see if the person had good immunity or if they were energic, um, what they would do is they would inject the, um, the TB test and then to make sure that their immune system was doing, giving them a good test, uh, they would put a little candida, a little bit of trichophyte and all these things that most people react to because your immune system reacts to them. So they would, so for years, injecting candida was a routine test of the cellular immunity. So if you had a TB test and it was negative and the candidate was positive and it showed a little itchy bump two days later, then you knew that, hey, the person wasn't allergic. Um, it wasn't like um, they had a false negative or anything like that. So it was just a diagnostic test. But being a professor of dermatology, this hired guy said, well, you know, why don't we just use it not only as a diagnostic thing, let's like turn around and he looked at it from a totally different angle. He said, let's use it as a as a, um, a real stimulating therapy. So let's inject it into warts and let's stimulate the immune system 
to get rid of the warts. And nobody ever thought of that before. So he was having great success, and he actually published it. Unfortunately, he only published it in Japanese. And only many years later did one of my friends actually do a free translation from um, Japanese into English. So when he died, his idea languished, just like the, um, the ophthalmoscope. I mean, people dropped the ball. And then there was a uh, medical student in, um, by the name of Ruth Bolton. She became a family practice doctor, but she was a medical student at uh, Mayo Clinic. And when she was a resident, she just had this great idea. She said, oh, maybe we should use this TB skin test, you know, reagent, the candida. Uh, let's use it, and let's use it as a therapy. So she had the same exact idea, totally independent of this um, Dr. Harada. And this was like back in the 80s. And in f her family practice colleagues like castigated her and they like ridiculed her and they made fun of her and they called her the wart lady and and she was curing people's warts left and right and um and so she finally she couldn't take the grief anymore so she just like dropped the ball she started her private practice and she even did a double blind placebo controlled trial and she never published it and later on when i heard that i was like why didn't you publish it? This is like great. I mean, this is what we need. And she said, oh, I got busy starting my practice and everybody was giving me such a hard time. It wasn't worth it. So, you know. so it's funny how people drop the ball and, and other people. And I learned about it from a family practice doctor who was, learned it from another family practice doctor who was giving lectures in Bay City, Michigan. And then I heard about it. We did a study. Then University of Arkansas did a study. And when we, we were at the academy meeting, we were telling them about what we were doing. They're like, you're injecting me. What? And it was just such a weird idea. I mean, they just, I mean, the girl next to me at my poster from University of Arkansas, um, Dr. Marchese, she, she thought of it independently, just like Ruth Bolton. She didn't know anything about Carter. She didn't know anything about um, Ruth Bolton. She, she thought it was her idea, and it was, because, I mean, she independently thought of it. But then when I was right next to her with my poster, she was like, wait a minute. You know, how did you hear about this? I was like, oh, didn't you know? You know, Seichi Harada did this. Professor Harada did it like decades ago. She's like, oh, I thought I just thought of it. Well, she did, but, you know, so that's how ideas work. And then, um, so for years, like, I was giving lectures at the Academy of Durham every year, like for like six years at the national meeting. And people were like, you're injecting what? You know, and after six years, then I just, you know, I um, just published our study and then I stopped giving lectures. But enough of the seeds have been planted between the University of Arkansas and a bunch of other people. And now, like about a year ago, the Mayo Clinic just published this um, study. It said, a review of 100, our experience with 100 cases successfully treated warts with the Candida immunotherapy. And that was like many years later, so that was like 2015. So it took from 1979 to 89, 99, 2009, so it took like about 40 years, like four decades for like what seemed like a pretty great idea that had, you know, it was pretty self, I mean, it, it, it was... Um, it seemed like it would be a good idea, but it took like only 40 years, and this was just like a small idea. So think about Hahnemann and his like huge idea. It's taken over 200 years, and the people still haven't embraced it yet, you know? So it's, it's a real eye-opener about these new ideas. So, of course, we were talking about what we're referring to today is, of course, classical homeopathic medicine. Of course, it's a great idea. It's not just a very good idea, and everybody knows that it's safe, effective, inexpensive, it's renewable, sustainable. It's all these great things. So, so even though we get really frustrated and it's like, look, you know, wake up, guys. I mean, it's been over 200 years and you're still not getting it. So I guess, according to De Bono, we have to continue to be patient. We have to be confident. We have to just keep telling the world, look, this is why it's good. You know, people love it. It's easy. It's cheap. It doesn't hurt the environment. It's renewable, sustainable. It's inexpensive. But we just have to keep these bullet points. It's kind of like, well, what is it? Oh, this is what it is. And boom, boom, boom. Simple, safe. You know, and if enough people, you know, hear that, you know, hopefully Hahnemann will not have died in vain. You know, so we have to you know, not drop the ball. Why are we still fighting the same battle? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, well. It's just because it's a different idea, so everybody thinks it's different. 
it's not different. It's still the same concept of the masses being able to see, and then that controls what individuals see. Well, I think too that um, it's called unlearning. It's harder to unlearn than to learn. It's harder to unlearn something old than to learn something new. And especially when you have fact factions that have um, monetary investments in what already is in existence, not changing. Oh, exactly. So, um, well, I think it's only because we've already been taught how to unlearn. Because you were already open in the first place, but you were taught not to learn. What's well, called brainwashing. It's the yeah. difference between being educated and being brainwashed. Being educated is being able to accept new ideas and to use your judgment to take in information and make it a, a personal, individual assessment. Right, but the education system teaches you to just give what they say and tell them what they say. They don't actually teach you. Right, it's more about conformity than being able yeah, to exactly. Right, but you know, Dunham wasn't it Carol Dunham who went went about trying to prove that huh, that homeopathy doesn't exist, and he said, "Oh, oh wait a minute, it does work." No, it's herring. Herring. Yeah, there have been a few people who have done that. They their superiors tell them to disprove it, and then they actually find out. So yeah, there's, yeah, the there's a few. Yeah, the paper written, people. and they said, "Well, I should test it first before I uh, actually uh, discredit it." And uh, then he became one of the greatest advocates of homeopathy. Right. Saved his life too for him getting something about maybe TV or dissecting or what was it? And everybody had some illness, but homeopathy saved his life, and then. So for the webinar people, um, some of the comments have been, well, how come, how come a homeopathy isn't taking off as good as we think it will? Well, one of the comments was the educational system that, you know, if our professors are telling us, oh, no, they don't have any data, that homeopathy stuff doesn't work. You know, people in, in, in academic positions, you know, we respect them and stuff for what we think they know. And if, and if you have a great idea and if somebody you perceive is more experienced than you tells you, oh, no, that stuff doesn't work, you might summarily um, except what they said is the truth. And they might be totally way off base because there is data that support it and stuff. But if somebody that's training you and you're doing your residency with them and they say, oh, that stuff doesn't work, you might say, okay. Just like um, the candidate treatment, there was this um, really smart lady. She was doing a PhD in um, immunology or something like that. And she independently had this great idea about let's inject warts with candida to stimulate the natural innate immune system. And she would have been famous. This was like in, in Cincinnati, like about you know 10, 20 years ago. And then um, her her thesis, PhD thesis people told her, oh, that's a stupid idea. It'll never work. And she said, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess it was a dumb idea. And now she's probably kicking herself because you know it really was a great idea, and she didn't have the confidence to believe in her own idea. And somebody talked her out of it. So unfortunately, you're totally right. The educational system, we we have to be careful what we tell our students because. Yeah, yeah, it, and I mean, they could have good ideas, and you know. Part of it too is like, for example, like Wikipedia, um, these places of knowledge. I mean, nowadays we look everything up on Wikipedia, but the Wikipedia page on homeopathy is totally biased against homeopathy, right? In the first couple times, it's a pseudoscience. And then all the references are like not standard references, not peer reviewed journals, but like Quackluster uh, websites and stuff like that. Yes. And, you know, it's like certain. They're supposed to be like a repository of knowledge, of open knowledge, but it's become co-opted by a certain uh, worldview. It's true. And uh, it's interesting. I saw an article in Townsend Letter uh, I just read the last couple of days. Uh, and Jane Ellman actually met the founder of Wiki, Wikipedia in, in somewhere in a conference and saw him there and said, "Hey, you realize that you're you say it's a, it's an open encyclopedia and everyone can make comments, but in fact, it's very biased against them." Yes. And so he wrote this long letter to. So far, nothing's changed, but that just shows you how the, <clears throat> the paradigm, when there's an established paradigm, to change it. It's very difficult. That's a good point. So, Tim was saying um, that. Like, look at Wikipedia. You know, it's supposed to be uh, open, open. You know, and unbiased. Open, unbiased. And if you read it, it says that homeopathy is just a total, you know, waste of, you know, it's just totally not true. And what could be further than the truth? So, so like I say, people in 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 places of of educational power, we have to we have to make sure that they're not misusing their power against it for their own financial or power otherwise. And that's a great point. So thinking of new ideas, I thought we would talk about two new ideas that I heard about. Um, they're both natural, but they're not homeopathy. But sometimes it's nice to know about them too, so I thought we could quickly go through them. Um, this is kind of cool, actually. Um, 
there is something that you can do. It takes like about maybe five minutes or less. You're supposed to do it every day, and it's supposed to not only feel good, but it's supposed to really help you and your friends, uh, partners, wives, whatever, um, husbands' health. And we know about reflexology, how like if you stimulate a concentrated area of nerves, like the ear, like the foot, it's supposed to um, help um, help other organs that it's connected with. So the idea is, um, Gary and I are two spiritual t uh, teachers, Art and Persa, in this book here, even though it's a spiritual book, it has a few really good health ideas, and they're all really cheap. The idea that I told you a few months ago about having, if you have um, insomnia, that you take um, two tablespoons or teaspoons of honey at night, that was from the same book. They have all these like really cool little free natural health tips, and this is one of them. Yes, Francine? I, I, I neglected to ask you a question about that. What about uh, people with diabetes? Oh, with the, um, the honey? Yeah, that could be a problem. We got to make sure that it, you know it doesn't um, worsen their glycemic um, control and stuff like that. You know, maybe if they're an unstable diabetic, it wouldn't be a good idea. I mean, you know, yeah, it's not totally safe for everybody, but um, but supposedly, as far as sugars go, um, um, sometimes little bits of fresh fruit and also little bits of honey. Supposedly, at least the medical heretic or what's his name, the medical the medical medium, uh, Anthony um, Anthony. Uh, anyway. Um, he believes that, yeah, yeah. Um, he believes that little bits of fresh fruit and also honey are even good for diabetics, and that the current thinking is wrong. But nevertheless, you know, they te they can just test their blood, and if the blood goes high, then obviously that isn't the right thing for them. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so for this, um, it's really cool. And Anthony um, Williams. Anthony Williams. Yes, yes. Thanks, him. Um, so the idea is. There's five areas where if you do a quick massage, but it can't just be superficial. You gotta really get in there and move, you know, the subcutaneous tissue and really just kind of massage gently but firmly. Your whole scalp that takes maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and then your whole external ear, including the tragus and everything. So you're gently massaging the, the whole external ear. That takes maybe 20 seconds. And then the heart. How do you massage the heart? Well, we're not talking CPR. We're just talking um, your hand against the precordium and the, the base of where the um, heart is on your chest. And you're just basically massaging down to the sub-Q and the muscles over the heart. And supposedly that does stimulate the nerves and the reflexes to the heart and other places in the body. And that brings us to the navel. Even if you get a professional massage, they said that in the book that even professional masseuses um, don't usually massage the navel. And supposedly if you massage the navel and a little bit around it, that actually has reflexes going to your GI tract and you know the GI organs. And finally your feet. And then so you massage, it's not just like a feel-good massage, you're actually getting in there and really you know working it for maybe 30 seconds. So you could do that to your spouse or significant other, or if you live alone you could do it to yourself. And the idea is don't be afraid if there's areas like on your foot that it's like it's feeling good and all of a sudden it's like, ooh, that's painful. Well, then lighten up a little bit, but don't neglect those areas. The point of pain is like a trigger point for probably some internal organ or something that's probably unhealthy. So the idea is if you continually do this reflexology, it's supposed to um, help. And then as it gets, as the, um, as that organ gets better, that reflex point, the trigger point is less painful. So um, it might be painful, but a few months later, you might be like, hey, my foot doesn't hurt anymore. So the idea is not only is it feeling good, it's supposed to have like nerve um, connections, which are supposed to heal corresponding organs. And the, the way I think of it is, look, if it works, I mean, I think it probably would work intuitively, but if it doesn't, at least you're getting, it's free and you're getting a free massage, you know? So, I mean, it feels good. And it's got to be good for circulation, stuff like that. So intuitively, what do you guys think? I mean, doesn't that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, it couldn't hurt. Okay. Second new idea. But before we talk about the idea, we have to talk about what does the idea treat. So what does this lady have? And I'll give you a hint. The diagnosis is not vitiligo. Because you might say, well, look, it's kind of white here and white there. And just take them and say, oh, actually, I'll give you a hint. This is the good skin. So this is um, the good skin. And this, the hyperpigmentation, that's the abnormal disease state. So what does this person have? Is the diagnosis vitiligo? I told you no. Uh, is it post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, like from having acne or eczema? Uh, is it um, pinta or yaws, which is uh, one of the non-venereal treponematoses? So it's like, it's like syphilis, but it's, it's not sexually transmitted. Is it that? Is it uh, Addison's disease? 
you know, like maybe JF, was, did JFK have Addison's? So it, does this person have Addison's disease? Is it tinea versicolor on the face? Is it tinea nigra, which is pigmented fungus? Uh, or melasma? Yes, or is it melasma? So who votes for any of those? Is it melasma? Melasma is, uh, let's see, um, melasma is um, when, it's usually in females, it usually has to do with um, female hormones, so the person, they call it the mask of pregnancy. So like, let's say you were fine, you just had a baby, you had all these hormone fluctuations, you're in the sun, all of a sudden you have it's like a, a chocolate milk mustache and you have like this stuff. So it's a hormonal type of uh, an issue. Now, when they talk about sepia and they talk about the saddle on the nose, do you think they're talking about melasma or what? So that, that was my feeling, yeah. So Tim was right. That's exactly what it is. So way to go, Tim. So what it is is, uh, hey, Tim, the thing says show main screen, go to webinar control panel. Um, should I just, um, sh what should I click here? Yeah, this just popped up, the webinar thing. Mm, okay, no. Oh, that thing. Good work. Okay, yes. Let's end it and let's go back into it. Go back into it. Oh, Tim's hit it. Okay, good. so the diagnosis, Tim was absolutely accurate. Way to go, Tim. Uh, it's um, melasma. The mask of pregnancy, the, in the old, like maybe 100 years ago, they may have called it cloasma for whatever reason. So, um, so of course, Hahnemann would say, well, um, you know, um, any really good physician would first try and get rid of the sustaining causes, the exciting causes. And we all know with melasma, um, one of the exciting causes is somebody put them on birth control pills and the hormones are causing it. So you try and get them off the birth control pills or they're on bioidentical hormones or something like that. Um, and of course sunlight has to do with it. So you have them wear a hat, you have them try and avoid noon day sun, you might have them wear like a natural sunscreen. But the trouble is, a lot of people already do that. You've already, you know, made sure they got off the hormones, get them out of the sun. And the trouble is they still don't get better. So then, of course, we do a good case. And the case I just showed you, she was like a perfect sepia. Almost everything, that was when I um, um, discussed here, like about four years ago. Almost, she didn't stop drinking. She was an alcoholic. Um, her, so many things got better. But the one thing that didn't get better was her melasma. So, so that's why I'm presenting this. Um, there's a there's a new idea on topical treatment of melasma. So my question to you, though, before we talk about that, is with your experience, because a lot of you guys have a lot more experience than I do um, with homeopathy. Does melasma get better if you really get the constitutional remedy, or do you have to go for pathologic prescribing? Do you have to give them like a, you know, like does it is constitutional chronic remedy not the way to go? Do you have to go with like the specific remedy for hyperpigmentation, discoloration of the face? Or doesn't it get better at all? And if it does, how much does the, the melasma get better? Because I've only treated two cases, and I've had zero help. But I've just been going for the chronic remedy, and, and two out of two, I'm just shot down in flames. So what do you think, Dr. Um, Shepard? Sometimes it's not just hormones, it's the pigmentation. Sometimes it's the color. Mm -hmm. Not that much. But if it's purely from the, from the hormones. Like they didn't have it before, and now they've got it. Then it'll change completely. From the inside out, you have to get the whole body in order, and then it's going to recover. But sometimes the, the pigmenting is scarring. So, in your experience, and Tim and Fancy and everybody, in your experience, what do you think? If you really get the right remedy, and you go from the inside out, and it really takes time, so let's say you've done all that, what percentage? Do you think it's permanent and scarred and you, you'll never fix it? And what percent do you think it's like completely gone? Well, just hazard a guess if you had to guess. You know, in young women uh, that had pregnancy and it came out, and it's, uh, it's way over 50 percent, depending on your skin type. So at least 50 percent or way more. Okay, good. So that's that's just pretty good odds. But in older women, older women, you know, you can't. So it's not just hormones anymore. It's lots of so those people, it's kind of like you can't really do much. So, so um, for the webinar people, Dr. Shepard's point was, if it's a young woman who maybe she just had a, a quick onset of like you know the hormonal changes of pregnancy, 
if you really intervene quick, there's like way over a 50% cure rate, and you can really impact it 100%. Whereas with older people that have had it for a long time, it's almost like it's scarred. It's just like it's in, intractable. So that's a good point. Um, so, and of course, see the trouble with treating it from conventional derm is that so even if you get the pigment to go away, you know, for years and years you got to have them on sunscreens uh, because if they just for one day go out in the sun for five minutes mailing a letter at the post office or something, um, then for six months the pigmentation comes back. So, so, um, so certainly in conventional derm we can't cure it at all. All we can do is just control it and it's a real bear. So do you think that in the young person with the good prognosis and the right chronic remedy, so do you think she'd be able to go out in the sun without sunscreen for the rest of her life and still be cured and not get it? Yeah. The reason why I ask is because you remember Dr. Mabu DK who gave us the, the nice lecture from uh, Romania. Um, he has um, a case report. I think it was just one person with melasma, but he claims that the right constitutional remedy not only made the pigmentation go away, but now she doesn't have to use any sunscreen. She can be out in the noonday sun and she doesn't get it. So that was just an anecdote of one. But what he's saying is mirroring what Dr. Shepard just said that with the right remedy, you don't have to make them, you know, avoid the sun. In fact, CPS love the sun, and yet, if you really get the right remedy, so so his case is kind of going along with what you're saying that, and that would be revolutionary for dermatology because nobody nobody cures um, melasma. I mean, you know, even if you get them clear a couple minutes in the sun, and it's all over again. So interesting. What well, what is what was the patient's age? This patient here uh, is. Uh, 40, maybe 43 or so? Uh, no, but I mean Dr. Namadipi's case. Oh, I can't remember. I have to look it up. I have it in my computer. But um, I'm guessing she was like middle-aged, same thing, kind of 45-ish or so. I can't remember. It's been so long since I looked at his article. I'm guessing... Oh, um, well, I think her kids at the time were about maybe eight or so. The oldest one is about maybe eight, so I'm guessing at least eight years, because usually it has onset after the first, like, you know, pregnancy. So, so either, even though it was a good remedy, maybe it was like a close simum, but maybe it wasn't a, a real true, maybe simum, maybe. But basically, so I'm on the right track. I should be going for the chronic remedy. I shouldn't be going for like a like a pathological prescribing. Okay, so go for the chronic. Probably very other than the discoloration work symptoms, which is it? No symptoms, yeah. No, in fact, if, aside from the fact that, yeah, so you could use what? Um, uh, face uh, uh, discoloration brown, I guess, you know? Browns. Mm -hmm. Is that different than like age spots? They call them lipofusion patches? Well, um, well yeah, it's, it's different. Well, of course. At least we, we think now it's different. I mean, who knows? A hundred years from now, maybe they'll say it's the same thing. It's just localized, you know. But yeah, it, it they think at least as far as we know with our knowledge base now, they think it's different. But um, even men can get it because men have tiny bits of estrogens and stuff in their body. But usually women. So anyway, um, the only reason I was interested in this when I saw this article out is that. Um, I've only had two people I've treated for melasma, and that's the reason why they came to me. And I did the whole two-hour workup and everything, and and it's not getting better. So I just so it's nice to know that people like Dr. Shepard, Dr. Schur, people um, in the audience have had good results. It's not always, but especially if you get it early. Um, so that gives me new hope that I, you know, I'm not barking up the wrong tree. I should continue treating them homeopathically and hopefully get them better. In the meantime, if I can't, there's this new stuff, a new treatment of this old stuff. Um, uh, it's called uh, Syllabum marianum, which is, it's, um, it's this prickly weed that grows in people's um, like property and in the wild, but it has this very pretty um, kind of purple flower, and um, they call it milk thistle, or the name is Syllabum marianum, or they call it Syllamarin. Um, and there was this guy that, oh, by the way, this is my disclaimer, it's not classical homeopathic medicine, it's just an herbal medicine, topical cream, but there was a guy, and I think he's in Iran, uh, Tagreed 
uh, Al Alte, and um, he did this great little study, and it got published in um, the MC Dermatology it's a, um, online journal. And the idea was, first he looked at 24 albino rabbits, he shaved them, put them in the sun for, I think it was like four hours a day for 30 days, and then they did histology and they looked at all the pigmentation. I don't think um, rabbits get melasma, but it was like an animal model where they got like, like age spots and stuff like that on their skin, and he biopsied them, and he showed before and afters um, when he put the cream on their skin, and um, he actually showed some really good um, data points where it really got rid of the histological sun damage. So he said, well, as long as it's safe and it's simple in rabbits, let's do it on people. So that's what he did here. And he had a bunch of um, slides, but this is one of them. They did the cream. There was like the strong cream, 14 milligram per ml, and then there's the one that wasn't so strong. And this is the placebo cream, and this is real people uh, with um, melasma. And in a week, I'm sorry, in a month, the people with the placebo cream, as you can see, nothing happened. The size and the color, there's other um, graphs that show like color, but this just showed the size. You know, at the end of the month, they still had the same surface area of melasma had not improved because it was placebo, so that would make sense. But look at what happened with even the wheat cream. The wheat cream is in the blue. It took about four weeks, but at the end of the four weeks, the melasma had completely cleared up. I mean, that's like unheard of. I mean, you could use expensive bleaching creams for like $300 for a tube of it, use it for six months and only get like 50% improvement. So, I mean, this is like... No, but you can buy this to take um, in the health food stores, um, milk thistle. In fact, um, you can go to um, Vitamin World and for like under 20 bucks, you can get like a, like a six-month supply and people take it by mouth. Um, so anyway... Um, uh, but what this guy did was, from Iran, he, um, he got the silymarin and he sent it to China and there was a compounding pharmacy who made the cream for him. And he made it in two strengths, 7 milligram per ml and 14. Um, so as far as I know, I, if you ever can find the cream here in the United States already made, let me know because I don't think we have it. But I, I talked about it to uh, one of the dermatology professors at Loyola that I work with at the VA on Mondays. And he said, oh, I know what that is. We give that to our, um, what are those birds? You would know, Francine. Cockatiels. Supposedly, cockatiels, as they get older, supposedly, they all get liver problems. It's kind of a cockatiel thing. So the, the specialty bird vet, and Jeff might not be able to tell us more about that. He said, um, uh, the vet tells them as the birds get older, they all have to be on a supplement of silymarin is kind of a, a, a hepato supportive, a liver supportive kind of a um, natural remedy. So he says, oh yeah, I know where to buy that. So um, he said, I buy mine, because um, he had this more expensive stuff that the vet wanted him to buy. So he was just getting vitamins at the vitamin world, and, in, and for like, uh, it was like um, $18.95 or something plus tax. I mean, look at this, this is 500 milligrams for ml. And the cream that the guy that I just showed you, his cream was actually like 14 milligrams per ml. It's really interesting that they call spots on the face liver spots because uh, interesting. Samarin is a very potent specific liver for the liver antioxidant. Exactly. And I've seen it cure up cirrhosis, clear up people that have been drinkers. Really? And have cirrhosis. You start giving them this and their liver starts to What it's dose crazy. would you I give mean, them? Just whatever I, they I, could get. Yeah, you know, I told tell people, I had, one, I had one incident, this woman was waiting a liver transplant. Wow. And this was a, a friend of my patient, and said because they had her on um, steroids for lupus, and they had given her so much that her liver had gone south, and then wow. she was on waiting list. And so she said, is there anything I can tell her, please, please, please? And I said, she's not my patient, and I'm going to deny I had told you this, but tell her to go to the store and just get... Salmar and, and you know by itself, not with other herbs in it, in the capsules, take it three times a day, uh, twice the dose that they recommend. Wow. And she said that this woman, I couldn't believe this, because this was, I, I don't think I was even doing homeopathy or I just started at the time. She said this woman asked her, her doctor, who was calling her almost every day to see how she was, if, um, if she could do it. She says, I don't see why not. The week after she started it, now her liver enzymes were like off the chart, you know, real high. And a week after she started it, she begged the doctor to please do the do the, uh, um, the blood work again. The doctor said, "Well, nothing could have changed." She says, "Please, just to know I'm going the right direction." All her liver enzymes are Wow. 
So uh, Dr. Burke was saying that she had a friend of a friend who was waiting for a liver transplant, had you know terrible cirrhosis or whatever damage to the liver, and they put her on um, silymarin. Uh, the, herb. the herb, which is the same as this stuff here, yeah. you know, by mouth, three times a day, and supposedly her liver functions totally went back to normal. So no, she, did, so she didn't need the transplant? Limits, yeah. Did she ever need the transplant? No. Wow, so that actually averted a, a liver transplant. That's a great they've find. They've done studies with, I know that they've done studies, this is, I read this a long time ago with dogs, so they give a dog a, a toxin that destroys the liver, and I don't even mind thinking about it. Right. This. But they had given uh, one or two of the dogs, or however they did it, the Salmarin with the same time, and then exposed it to the toxin. Those dogs had no liver damage. Yeah. The other dogs, when they did the autopsy on it, the livers had just totally pulverized. So the, Dr. Burke's point is well taken. So Salmarin is really well known as, as an herb by mouth among naturopaths and others as, as a liver protectant. The interesting thing is, from a derm standpoint, this is really cool. We're always thinking, you know, instead of giving people sunscreens, isn't there anything we can give people by mouth? We all know about nicotinamide and the recent study of vitamin B3 helping prevent precancers and cancers of the skin, and non-melanoma cancers, uh, and that was published in the New England Journal. But this is something else that I think dermatologists are underutilizing. It, in, in this this article, there's a brief review, it says that actually there have been studies that have said that um, it's not only good for your liver, but it's anti-cancer. Um, it's, easy. it's even anti-melanoma. They have people where they have malignant melanoma and um, the cells have a harder time spreading if you're taking this, you know. So, I mean, this is something we should all know about. Um, supposedly, anecdotes have said it works in melasma, vitiligo, psoriasis, psoriasis. I'm going to have to start trying it. Um, I gave it to one person with psoriasis and it helped a little bit. Maybe not super great, but it did help a little and it's cheap. I mean, it's under 20 bucks. Um, but look at this. Is this ever cool? Um, we know about people that die from, you know, they go out mushroom hunting like in Europe, you know, you're in the, the forest reserve here, you're getting your mushrooms, you think you know what you're doing, and then you wind up dead the next day after you make your stew with mushrooms in it because you, you actually ate one of the Amanita poisonous mushrooms instead of one of the really good ones. And, um, and it's too late, and there's not really a whole lot you can do. I mean, they give them charcoal by mouth, but a lot of people still die from eating mushrooms that are poisonous. So, once again, Europe is, is way ahead of us. The Germans and um, the Europeans have found a way to purify the same silver and that Dr. Burke was telling us about. They purify the alkaloid, it's called silabinin, and they actually have it. It's approved. So if you come into the emergency room saying, my son is puking his guts out, he's going to die, he just ate this poisonous mushroom, they would hook him up to an IV and then they would give him this IV silabinin, which is silabinin, and they call it Legolon SIL, and it's used IV in Europe, it's approved, and then it saves the kids or the adults' life. Now, what do they do in the United States? Well, we don't have it. So what you do is um, you give one gram. So if you look back here, uh, oops. so mm -hmm. this is, you'd have to give two mLs of this stuff, and that would be the same as one gram. So the good thing is we have it here, and that's why it's probably good for people to have this at home already in their medicine cabinet in case anybody gets poisoned. Um, um, and so the idea is you have to give it quick because once the toxin kills your liver cells, there's nothing you can do. But the idea is the silabinin or the silmarin actually interferes with the hepatocytes uptake of the amanita toxin. So early is the way to go. So why do they give it IV in Europe? Well, because after about an hour of eating these mushrooms, you start puking your guts out and then you can't keep oral things down anymore. So if you, if you ate it and um, you thought you were being poisoned, you'd want to start taking it orally as soon as you can before you start vomiting it. So that's really interesting. This was, on, this was not a, like a, a naturopathic journal. This was like out of eMedicine Medscape. Um, and they, um, they, that was one of them. And then the other one was one of the pharmacy um, biotech um, articles. And so that's what they're doing in Europe right now. So, I mean, hopefully we'll get it here. But so since this is a homeopathic group, I have to show you this. Is this ever cool? I mean, when I was at the British Institute, they were saying, well, you know, you're supposed to get the chronic remedy, but, but there are some sort of organ-specific, you know, um, like homeopathic remedies, you know. And, and we all learned about Cardus Marianus. But I didn't know in Latin all these years, I didn't know that for... Um, Cardus Marianus is the same as Silymarin in um, 
in you know in the naturopathic world, it's the same as sil um, syllabum Marianum or Saint Mary's um, thistle. So, so everybody knows that you know, like for test cardus Marianus, that's like you know, it's the the homeopathic remedy that's specific for the liver. But I didn't know it, so I looked it up in J. H. Clark, and sure enough, it said cardus Marianus, same as Saint Mary's thistle, same as psyllimarin. Is that ever cool? I mean, I didn't even know that that was the same stuff that the the natural um, herbalists are using. I wonder if it's known in the repertory. Uh, that's a good point. You could look up um, face uh, discoloration bronze or brown and, and would Cardus Marianus be in there? That's a great, so Tim had a great idea. He's searching right now. So Tim's searching to see if, if melasma, if, if uh, Cardus Marianus could be one of the homebiotic remedies for it. Under face, there's eight rubrics that have that remedy. Face discoloration, dirty looking. Face is discoloration, in yellow. There? Face dryness, face dryness, lips, face greasy. Is Cardus in there? Yes. Yeah, that's all. These rubrics all have it. Oh. If you just do a search, you have to do a search with the remedy in words. Yeah, sure. I'm mm -hmm. doing searching in, in the material medic in the documents, but I got charismatic Cardus Marianus under Borky. Oh. Borky brown spots. Ah, so maybe, maybe this is a, a regional type remedy we should be using for for elasma. There's a lot of there's a lot of rubrics for this. There's a lot of uh, it's got 58 generals it's under the skin. I, I looked under face. I didn't look under skin. So it looks like this is in Borky's repertory. It's under brown spots. So Borky added it. Yeah, Borky's repertory brown spots. It's under the skin, just under the skin. It's also under, it's also graded at three under skin discoloration, yellow jaundice, Icarus. Right, it's a little bit under. Itching, there's a lot of itching ulcers. It doesn't have, oh, here's skin discoloration, plasma. Really? So it's actually so in there. There's 21 remedies in there. It's graded to one. That's a great idea, Tim. We should maybe start doing that. I'll start taking some before and after pictures to see if it works. There's so also that, an article I found here in the uh, British Medical Journal. British Journal of Homeopathy from 1852. 1852, uh, volume 10, it says here, it talks about Clasma. Clasma, they call it Pitariasis versicolor. It's easily recognized as brown regular spots, geographical fashion on the body, especially the chest and abdomen. Well, um, Pitariasis um, versicolor is the same as Tinea versicolor. Uh, Pitariasis. That's an old name for tinea versus color. Uh, so hmm, maybe they're confusing cloasma. So, but it, did it work for that too? Yeah, they're calling it cloasma or pityriasis versus color. That's a really cool idea. Yeah. Andrew confounding of the copper colored syphilitic or mercurial spots. And it says here the long list of medicines given by a jar as available in this affection. We have antimonium, which has brown spots or dots, cocculus, red, irregular shaped spots on the skin. I'll make a copy of this and send it to you. Really? That's it's very cool. Uh, Clonium, laxus, vitum, phosphorus, of course, sepia. So even though we, we're going to try and find the chronic remedy for, for people like melasma patients like this, but I guess, you know, maybe we could try Cardus Marianus. The interesting thing was I was looking it up. They said Cardus Marianus from a homeopathic standpoint, if you look on the Boyron little blue tube, it says indications hemorrhoid. And so I guess the idea is like if you had chronic liver failure, what would happen? You'd have all this portal hypertension, you'd have esophageal varices, you might get hemorrhoids, you know, you might get all those things. So um, if you had hemorrhoids from liver failure, the idea is maybe Cardus Marianus might help. So um, supposedly if you have right upper quadrant pain, uh, you know, um, liver pain that's been used for that, Jaundice, clay-colored stools, dark urine, that goes along with liver failure. Even if you had varicose veins, with, with supposedly with lots of ulceration, if it were due to liver failure, perhaps Cardus Marianus could be used, and same with hemorrhoids. So, so it was kind of like an aha moment. I was, I was thinking, I was doing all this stuff about the herbal, herbal silymarin, and, 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 and then it said Cardus Marianus. I had no idea that Cardus Marianus was the same name as, you know, Sullivan Marianus. I didn't know either. That's great. So, does anyone use it? Um, I haven't yet, but um, so the, have, have you used it as a specific for liver problem people? That's right. 
disease. Has it helped? So it's sporadic, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Because those are all the common symptoms. Right. Oh, speaking of treating specifics when you have nowhere else to go, thank you so much. I just want to shout out a thank you to Dr. Shepard. You helped my dad immensely. Um, my dad, 93, he was dying of um, um, heart failure, and his legs were swelling up, and the heart cardiologist said there's nothing else you can do. And, and remember at the last meeting, I think it was, you said, well, you could try um, um, ammonium carbonicum. So I gave him one of um, Tins dun Dunham's, the 200, one dose of that, and his swelling of his legs completely went away and never came back. It was like amazing. I mean, I know that's that's not the usual way of doing homeopathy, but sometimes when you've tried everything else and you know you're going for like a specific lesional pathology, but it's, so thank you so much. It really helped them. You know, it's a bigger and bigger problem today. They have all these successful drugs to prevent heart attacks, but then you can Yes. Um, and this is a, a a question. I'm going to ask you: Does this get better with homeopathic remedies? Because I've had one or two people with this, and um, and I just treated somebody, and I gave them their chronic remedy, and it just didn't help at all. So either I, you know, I gave the wrong remedy and it didn't work. But what I want to know is, does this condition get worse? This is this is the typical person, a woman, and it's a person in their 40s or 50s, and they start getting the dry, cracky heels. It's extremely common. They can get on the palms too, but especially dry, cracky heels. And there's even a, a name for it. Um, the idea is um, they're either in um, the climacteric, so they're 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 gone through menopause, or like this lady, she's like kind of premenopausal. I mean, um, she's a grand multip; she's not in menopause yet, but we usually see it like around 40s and 50s. So, um, before I ask you, does homeopathic remedies get better? Get it better? And I'm asking you that not because I know the answer; just I want um, I'd like to know does it get better? Um, but um, this was the case that I. Um, I gave um, her chronic remedy, which happened to be CPI, and I thought it was well indicated, and it didn't do anything for her. So my question is, um, what's what's the Durham diagnosis of this condition, and does and then what I really want to know is, does it get better with homeopathic remedies? So, what do you guys isn't call that? A, uh, isn't it due to a, a fungus? Uh, no, it's just irritant dermatitis from just drying and walking and you know stuff like that, but. Does anybody know the name? It's it's kind of something you have to know for boards. It's just a descriptive term. Um, it's called keratoderma climactericum, and all it means is it's just dry, cracky heels. You know, and people use a lot of you know emollients, you know, moisturizers for them and stuff. And dermatologists like to make a lot of you know big things, you know, like like a big thing of common things like that. But anyway, um, it's off. I don't think it's seen often in hypertension, obesity, and arthritis. But at least back in 1934, a doctor. Haxhausen found that he, he was seeing a lot of people that seemed they had just gone through menopause and they're you know, women who had gone through menopause are all like around 40, 50 years and um, they all seem to have hypertension, arthritis and, and obesity. I don't find that to be true clinically. They're just normal people with just dry cracky heels. But, oh, go ahead. Well, thinking outside of homeopathy, what about essential fatty acids? Oh, and D. so it could be like maybe they're not getting F-omegas and stuff like that and vitamin D. You know, they could be, you know, Something with the omegas and the deficiency. The, I don't know. Oh. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Acids, you know, the so put them on their fatty acids, yeah. And, you know, ADA and K. And That's a great looking, point. Maybe you know, your body's less efficient at processing our supplements. I don't know. So don't forget your, your good nutrition and your supplements for fatty yeah. acids. So the question is so let's say you, you really get the right homeopathic remedy. Does it get better or no? It's not always a dynamic disease. You have to really bring into the picture the cause of occasion else. And just to, and others. For instance, if someone is using a shovel all day long and they get calluses, that's not a, not a cure for anything. Right. So if it's a hardworking woman that's always walking a lot and on her feet, you know, you know, on her job or stuff, then you might not. If it's not a dynamic condition. Yeah, bad shoe, something wrong with the spine, you know, that makes posture. There's all sorts of external things you have to take into account why it doesn't work, but we have to look at it. So, I've seen a change with remedies. I mean, to what degree? Like 100%? Sometimes it changes quickly, sometimes not. I know in my own case, I've had cracked heels, and, but it's taken a long time and it's gotten better over time. Many remedies are about one remedy. 
So it's not like a slam dunk yeah, you I'm give a it to him. Too, so when he runs, it tends to, uh, you know. So it could get better, but but don't be impatient. It could take many months. Okay, thanks. That's good to know. You know, other causes, external causes, maybe nutritional, and somewhat dynamic. It's a combination. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask because it says you're looking at the foot and fall out of your shoes. So cracks, cracks, yeah. Extremities cracked heels. Extremities cracked heels. That's a big sepia, big black podium. Andre always says it's right side, more like podium, more. Well, I don't think the CPI, but oh, the heel. So there's and that's just something that you can follow, but yeah, it doesn't always change. It doesn't always change. So basically, I shouldn't be looking for the slam dunk. I shouldn't be like four weeks later. You know, it's not better. Don't be disgruntled. I mean, it might take years. Is what you you're know, saying? You know, sometimes it's like you treat people over time, and you, you that's what we're always treating the whole person. And over time, you're treating, you're treating, you're treating, and certain symptoms are improving, and certain symptoms aren't. Those are maybe more due to lifestyle, nutritional deficiencies, something the person's doing, right. analysis. So then if things aren't changing, you have to think, why? Why not? But right. it doesn't, I mean, sometimes it changes soon, but going away, curing. So it could be like fungal toenails. They might get better with the right remedies, but it might take many, oh, many months. Too. Same kind of a thing then? Okay. I just want to say in this rubric, I'm kind of surprised to look at the authors. Andre has added a bit. At least half of those remedies. So Andre has added aloe, he's added arsenicum, he's added orum, orinum, carb, causticum. I mean, we do have the other ones like lycopodium, like and he's, he's added, well, I think he's upgraded CP223. Um, Staphysagri is in there, he added it. Silica is in there, he added it. Sulfur, he added it. So a lot of those are his own clinical experience and probably from the literature. And from yes. the literature. So if you don't have his additions, you wouldn't know. know. So there's a plethora of, of chronic remedies that could help that. Alumina is there. Aconine. Before we move on, I want to make a point about the similar and that great. Yes. You know, um, and warns not to apply on the skin. Oh. And until, you know, until the very end. But old words sometimes don't go away. Then he allows it. But you have to make sure the whole person is healthy within. And if it's been there too long, then maybe you lose on the skin. But if it's a fresh case, you take away your signals to know whether you're really helping the internal first. So Dr. Shepard's point is well taken. So if you see somebody with melasma, don't just right, uh, jump to the cream. You know, you want to make sure the inside of the person, like Hanum would say, would be help, um, helped first. And, and after many months and years, then maybe go for that. Good point. Um, this is um, a case that we talked about last May, and this is what I showed you that she was getting better with her chronic remedy, which is Nature Muriaticum. But I just want to show you real quickly her um, eight month follow up. So I just saw her like about three weeks ago, and then this is her actually in eight months. And she's still on the Nature um, 200C sporadically, and she's doing even better. How long um, is she taking it? Um, about maybe two or three doses a week. Does she know any activation? Does she take it? Not, not so much, no, not that she said. Um, the other thing that she's just totally pleased with is her and insomnia completely got better since we got her on the Nature Muriaticum, and she had terrible menstrual cramps, and her menstrual cramps are not gone, but they're much improved. So that's helping me think that, yes, it really is her simulomum and not just, not just a Band-Aid for her acne. Speaking of um, getting the insides nutrition right, like Dr. Burke just said, uh, we did put on old flaxseed oil to get some omegas and... Um, and also, she had a little bit of um, organic glycolic acid topically, um, but uh, otherwise, she's doing really good with her chronic remedy. And the last really quickie was, oh, I wanted to thank um, two of the people from Noosh, Dr. Aikenhead and Dr. Richter, that sent me this case. Um, this was a lady who had this chronic facial eruption, ruddy face for 22 years. Uh, happened when she got married, with her pregnancies, it got worse. And she's been to um, dermatologists, family doctor, and they've given her antibiotics and things like that, which help, but she gets off of it, and of course it comes right back. And the last few years, she just hasn't treated it at all just because she's just kind of sick of having a chronic uh, skin condition. But um, Dr. Um, uh, Richter and uh, Dr. Aiken had thought it would be good for her to see a dermatologist, so she, they're kind of to send her. And so um, this is her. So this is what she has. Her normal complexion is about this color. Um, it, she's actually lighter than this, but with this coloration, um, with, with the projector a little darker, but she's actually uh, light-complected, and she's got this really ruddy complexion. 
um, redness, uh, little um, pimples, and some plantacasia. And so anybody want to hazard a guess in terms of rosacea? So is it rosacea? Is it systemic lupus erythematosus? Um, if you're seronegative and you're like, <coughs> your ANA is negative and you don't have lupus, there's a condition called Yesner's infiltration of the skin where they get this, it looks just kind of like this, and they get these um, lymphocytes that just come to the skin. We have no idea why. It looks just like lupus, but it isn't. So is it Yesner's lymphocytic infiltrate? Um, it could just be like, you know, maybe she's a tugboat captain or maybe she's a merchant marine and she's just, she's getting like wind and, you know, just like ruddy face just from the elements. So it could be any of those things. But Tim is absolutely correct. This is just a real classic case of um, rosacea. So um, I really thought she was a natrum and she had this very serious kind of, um, she was sad, lots of seriousness. So mentally I thought she was a, um, possibly a, a natrum. And, and look at this. I thought, boy, this is going to be my first natrum cure that she's got this strange rubric where she gets sneezing only when she's in the sunshine. In fact, if she has a plugged nose and she's, she really wants to sneeze and clear it up, um, all she has to do is open the window blinds and look at the sun and she can induce herself to sneeze. Does anyone else depend on that? That's a genetic condition. It is. Really? Achoo genetic? Syndrome. What's it? Achoo syndrome. Really? It's a genetic. <coughs> so you have to look and see if everyone Achoo in the family syndrome. has it. Really? I, I, never a, I never asked but her. But they're the only one in the family. They're the only one. Is there anything else that Achoo syndrome has aside from that? Is it associated with any bad things like cancer or anything? Or, or just yeah, sneezing or something? just sneezing or something. Wow. I had no idea. There's an Achoo syndrome. Really? So then, so then remedies wouldn't help that. But if it's sporadic, would a remedy it's, it's help just, it? it? Because in the family, then if everyone in the family has it, it's like how peculiar is that? For the I don't know if anybody in I don't know if anybody in like my extended family has it. As far as I know, I'm the only one. I have four kids, but like all my, four kids, of them have it. my kids all have it. But I don't think anybody else. You know, like I I don't know any. It's weird in my family that I have it, but it's not weird in my family. Yeah. Did anybody get treated homeopathically and did it get blessed? Not specifically for that. So this is... <laughs> so in the last nine years that I've been doing homeopathy, um, it's so strange that within like the past month, I've had like two people with that same rubric, you know, sneezing in the sunlight. <laughs> and thank you, Tim, because I didn't know there was there even was a familial... Yeah, no, not true. I've seen this one. Oh, what? But not, again, not in everyone. So, it depends if it's maybe more genetic. So Tim said it could go away with the remedy if it isn't the familial thing. So I gave this to her, and not only did her face not get better, but the sneezy didn't get better, nothing got better. So I think I gave the wrong remedy. So I gave her another remedy. Um, so, but, but right after I saw her, I saw another person, and she was even more of a classic nature muriaticum. And I just saw her back, and not only is her skin thing getting better, but um, the sneezing in the sun completely went away just after four weeks of natrum. So what Tim said... Uh, even though that's my first time I ever had it go away with the remedy, that's the first time I ever treated it. This is the second or whatever. Uh, but that's interesting that it does get better. And there was, um, I think there was like, how many? Um, there was nine uh, remedies in that rubric. Natrum, uh, Mercurius, there was a few. Uh, let's see where's I've seen it with the remedies I've compared. Calicarb. Natrum, Mercurius, um, I think Selenium's there. But the ones I've seen are Natrum and Mercurius. Oh. <laughs> So Mercurius and Nature are, are Tim's top two cures for that, and Dr. Shepard just Mercurius, Sanguinaria, Dr. Burke says. Never seen it before. Yeah, that's from Borky. There's also a Gericus in there. A Gericus in there. Mm. Badiaga, Hydrasis, Calicard. See, those are all from the literature. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the tips. And Tim, thanks for the Achoo syndrome. That's like really very cool. Achoo syndrome, that's cute. So I'm going to ask you, sorry, though. It's like one person, you, you have a symptom and it's peculiar and you get the remedy, it goes away. And another patient has the same symptom and it gets peculiar, it's found in the reptile, and it doesn't go away. There you go, because I've had two people and one did exactly. Everyone's unique. That's the thing. So then there's something more peculiar. <laughs> so, okay. so what happened was, um, so I was like, well, I struck out. So the thing was, she really got worse in, um, in you know, stuffy uh, air, 
She got worse in hot rooms. She was worse with heat. She was better with open air. And I was like, it sounds like a pulsatilla or like a podium. But I said, she just doesn't have the personality for pulsatilla, you know, at least the, what I'm, what, the stereotypes that I've read about. But I said, I think she's more of a pulsatilla than a lycopodium. So I gave her pulsatilla. And then, so this was like the baseline I showed you before. So she, you know, the baseline, gave her the natrium. She still looked like this. And then I gave her pulsatilla. And after just like three weeks of pulsatilla, she's like about 50 or 60% better. And the, um, I mean, if you would have told me this was my patient and she didn't get better with remedies, so I sent her to the dermatologist and they pulsed I lasered her face, you know, which of course, what you would get a result like that if you lasered her face. Um, but the cool thing is she had like, you know, like $8 worth of pulsatilla 30C. And, and so I showed this to Dr. Swan over at Loyola and, and now the guys at Loyola, they're really thinking homeopathically. And I told him, I said, I gave her pulsatilla. And he said, well, of course, because, you know, pulsatilla is worse with heat and everything. And, and, and our all rosacea patients are like worse with heat and everything. And so, is, so now they're thinking homeopathically. It's so cool. Uh, pulsatilla is a one under serious. Oh, see, so it, it could be a serious. So, we know these stereotypes about remedies, but maybe there's, you know. So Tim says you can't have a one plus for seriousness. So it's not just nature and doesn't have a, uh, um, a franchise on seriousness. <laughs> oh, pulsatilla for road race, really? Didn't work. Yeah. What was characteristic that made you think of pulsatilla? All the, all the modalities. He was too hot to sort of be down. He liked to sort of do a bit pulsatilla all the time. So Dr. Shepard's point is well taken. Pulsatilla works for road race, and you're just treating, you know, the symptoms and stuff, and don't don't think of stereotypes because for him, it worked for rage. That's under temper tantrums. It's under temper tantrums. May I say something about the repertoire? Oh yes, yes. I could always use tips on better repertorization. Yes. So when you have rubrics that are over 500, 30, 140 remedies in it, you're always thinking polyrhythms. Okay. So there should be another step that she needs to have the genius of the case. So how would I do that? You have to take, uh, so if you always have the large groups that you're always going to get the same. Okay, so it, the trouble with, so would you not use them or you just so put other things in to be more well, specific? You two steps. You do the totality. But from there, you have to decide what's in Oh. So you have to do another step. So would I use a second little clipboard for that step? Okay, good point. What's now, the we put in there? So the sneezing and the sneezing. And another thing is if you use that many rubrics, uh, you know, rubrics. This one calls it sulfur. Once you get 25 or more, sulfur right. is likely to be the most. So would it be helpful on the bottom of my Radar 10, I usually click like the fifth one, which is like summary of like the symptoms and the signs and stuff. But so maybe I should click the button that says small remedies and small rubrics, huh? I mean, that. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you use a lot of the, the big ones, Dr. Shepard is saying that um, you'll overrepresent the polycrest like sulfur and the polycrest, and the trouble is the real, you know, sumilima might be obscured and it might be over here. Good point. Good point. Thank isn't you. Isn't in the repertory that much, so. Yeah, I, I have a, a method that works for me when I repertorize. Is any rubrics that are really small, like maybe under ten or under five. I use a separate clipboard because I consider those to be very unusual, and I, I, I consider that those remedies, if I'm unsure of the main ones, but like Dr. Shepard said, you know, I, I don't, you know, I stay under a certain number for my, my um, rubric size because, you know, like any skin symptoms, no right. rubric is going to come from sulfur. Right, right. So maybe, so Dr. Burke, is saying that maybe use a um, for the smaller remedies and rubrics and stuff like that. You could use a like a, a second clipboard and just put them in there so they don't just get to it, just over to, represented. To make sure you look just to see if there's anything peculiar in any of those things because you know it could be an incomplete rubric. Sometimes I'll compare McRep with 
radar and I have so many more remedies in radar and sometimes I have remedies that are in radar that are not in the McRep rubric. So a, a small rubric I can I usually think of as incomplete. Mm. So possibility of being incomplete. We have to be careful. Like we had one we had the other day, sty in the eye. So the sty was in the lower lid of the left eye. So if you look under sty, there's 90 remedies. If you look under the sub rubrics, left and right, they add up to 20. Which I the other sex of the remedies in. Oh. So and then <laughs> if you look up under upper and lower, that adds up to like 15 remedies. So which lid is the other 75? So you have to be careful that you don't exclude possibilities as well and, and not use subrubrics to have a small number unnecessarily. And have you found that? I haven't found those subrubrics in style. Maybe so well. that, that particular one is a good example. They're yeah. hardly useful at all. But just arithmetically, you know they're incomplete. Mm -hmm. The right plus left doesn't equal general rubric. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the small ones are not helpful, those ex extremely specific ones. May I ask you a question just about that? Um, you know, sometimes you have uh, sidedness. Let's say we had side. We have left side, right sided, and then one side. <laughs> what do you do with something like that? I mean, so if, you, if something always happens in the right eye, or only on the right side, if you use one sided, that's applicable too, right? right. You have to be careful, and it, it has to be everything is always is on one side. Oh, that's a specific condition, for example. Left side, right side, and one side. Yeah. Okay, can I have two sides? Yeah, it's not that characteristic. It's more of a differentiation. But like for so throats, I find sidedness is useful. If you get sidedness and is it better warm or cold, you can often find a remedy. Yeah. Um, well, pneumonia is the same thing. It's left sided, right sided, upper, lower. That can help you in an acute, but it'll help you quickly find a remedy. So acute. Yeah, the person didn't have the four minutes of so specific with yeah. okay. So it's helpful. Yeah, yeah. more for kids. That's it. I always thought the one sided rubric had to do with um, it could be on either side, but it would, but when you had it, it was one side. So sometimes it had people say, you know, um, something about their, their, like their nose is stuffed up on one side. Or the other, it can change sides, but it's never both nostrils. Is that not what one sided means? Well, for the nose, it's a little tricky because, according to Eastern alternates, naturally. That has a rumor of also being yeah. the nose does. But it does on its own, according to Eastern prana. You know, it's, one nose is active and then the So it's natural, it's not a disease. So it has to, you have to be careful that it's something new that the patient didn't have. And so, for instance, with Sabadillo left side of there's synapsis nigra left side. You know, if, if, it's, if they're intense about it, that it only ever affects the left side, then you could use it. But and if it's left, but so one-sided, what if it could be either, but it's only yeah. one at a time? Yeah, no? No, it's one-sided under nose. The nostril being. Yeah, nose discharge one-sided, left and right, yeah. So you wouldn't use one sided with that interpretation. Hardly ever a big problem. Though you know, if everything like in Sabadella, if it's a left sore throat and it's a left nostril and it's a lot more injuries, then I consider the left sidedness. Right. So what does one sided mean then? If it doesn't mean what I thought it meant, what does it mean? That's Dr. Kramer, that's what it makes sense to me. So say if you have a recurrent condition, um and whenever it's acute, it's only one sided. It doesn't necessarily mean that every time you get it, it's on the right side, but every time you get it, it's only on one side. That makes yes. sense to me, which is, sounds like a quick time. Okay. Right, so, for people on the webinar, we're going to take about a two minute break. Don't go away, just a bathroom break, and then we're going to have Dr. Ananda Kramer enlightening us on a new remedy. So you've just never just ignored all these years. One side of the No, I usually use right or left side and that's the side of the We've got the 50x challenge. It's never needed. It's never needed. I'll just kill this in a piece of this. Yeah, yeah.
A lot of people only get them on one side. So I go to the side and take them off. I was like, huh, oh, they kind of resonated. I've misinterpreted it. I was in a clinic. We didn't have a lot of examination. What the thinking was, and the medical things we talked about there. And I was like, you know, I have a lot of those. So then when I was in the clinic, and I saw my intern, I was like, okay, I I need you to look at, um, I don't know. I was like, I need you to look at this. And I actually go into the dispensary. Isn't that Telia? Isn't there one? Telia has a one. It's like they let. It's not. It's if you lie on the right side, it's painful on the left. Something like that. So I think it's found under face discoloration, chlorasma in the complete repertory, or. Uh, Face discoloration brown spots. Yeah. And Elizabeth. Hey, Elizabeth, are you there? Yeah. Yes. How are you? Hi. Hey, so you had a question? No, I was just when I got a, when you in when you mentioned that. Um, Cardus marinus is the same thing as uh, so how do you pronounce it? So Silmarin. Silmarin. I remembered it jogged my memory that in a gallbladder attack, you know, liver gallbladder, um, I once used uh, Cardus in a tincture with ascending doses of kelp carb. <laughs> and it, it stopped the gallbladder attack in its tracks. Now you wouldn't do this in lieu of taking them to the hospital, but if you can do it in tandem, just in case it it works, <laughs> and then continue with it, uh, so you can sometimes, or I don't know, if, I don't want, I don't mean to say it globally, but in this instance, it stopped a gallbladder attack. Wow, that's great. So, so uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth was uh, saying that she had a uh, patient with a gallbladder attack and using Cardus Meterianus and Calcarea Carbonica stopped it. Yeah, let me, let me qualify on that. I, I, it, I use it on myself. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> it, was, it was my gallbladder and uh, it, it was something I grabbed to do before I did the other and it ended up working. I think we've had, I mean, Joel, I know, Joel, you probably had gallbladder attacks help with remedies. I know I have. If you find the right remedy, it, it, it you know, I don't think the stones necessarily go away, but the pain goes away. Well, maybe that's what it was. Well, but there, there was no reason to uh, go into the emergency room because, it, you know, it stopped screaming. Exactly, exactly. That's cool. all I had wanted to say. <laughs> cool. Uh, do you have any other comments or questions? Um, not at this time. No, it's been great. Great seminar. Okay, cool. Um, mute, mute you again. We'll say hi to Lisa. Hey, Lisa, are you there? Yeah, hi, Dr. Fjord. How are you? Uh, great, great. It's been a really excellent presentation. So i um, looking great. forward to Ananda's too. So I, I did have one question. Um, uh, Dr. Signore had mentioned he used uh, an organic Boric acid for the acne topically? Was that what he had said? Glycolic acid. Glycolic. Oh, glycolic. Glycolic acid. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I'm not sure what that's made from. Do you even know? Uh, Lisa has a question about the glycolic acid. Hi, Lisa. Um, glycolic acid is naturally found in um, grape juice. So if you ever drank oh, Welch's okay. grape juice as a kid, you've already drunk an organic acid called glycolic acid. And in okay. fact, is it, I think it's part of the Krebs cycle. I can't remember. I was never good in chemistry, but I, is it? Maybe it's not. No, no that's citric acid. Know, but... <laughs> okay. yeah, citric well, see, I was never any good at, at, at physiology anyway. So, but um, no, um, glycolic acid is just an organic acid, and it's found in fruits. Okay. And it just, it just so happens that um, commercially, some people will make like um, 
creams and lotions that have it. And it just it helps the post-inflammatory pigmentation from acne go away a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not necessary to use it, but sometimes people in dermatology, they insist on getting better faster in terms of the way they look. But yeah, that's what it's used for. It's, it's pretty cheap and it seems pretty safe. Okay, all right, thank you. I was the movie. Oh, <laughs> it was excellent. If you're a Harry Potter fan, I highly recommend it. <laughs> oh, you went to the opening. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was the opening. It was a 10 o'clock show, but uh, I loved it. Well, yesterday was the opening day, at least. It was the opening okay. day. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and, and Michelle had an excellent time, too. So. <laughs> That's my sister. That's strange. Cool. It has a lot. I went to see that. Yeah. Is it good? Oh, I it. Any other questions, Lisa? Uh, no, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet you then. And then, uh, what rubric did you use for rosacea? Barb Nolder? She's not on anymore. But I think there's a rubric, uh, acne, rosacea, face eruptions, acne, rosacea. And uh, which which are you going to show anything? Yeah, right now. This? <laughs> Do you want to show any of the handouts that you have yeah. on your computer? Yeah. Which one? Yeah, why don't you put them? Well, actually, I'm starting. Well, let's wait for Bob, but why don't we get what mm -hmm. you want up so you can, it's easy to show. Okay. So I should do this. Yeah. That's why I'm here. <laughs> but I can't see. I guess I'll do this first. So. Thank you for the refreshment. Yeah. Is that, is that, they have to show all that? Um, yeah, there's no way to make a presentation out of it. Uh, oh, you can get rid of, uh, here you just say, I'll get rid of everything. There. That's better. This is very much like I was Ruler, get rid of it. Yeah, I just have to go under view. Just click whatever you want on view. Okay. Is that better? Mm -hmm. That's better. And so then I'll just be. Wait, how will I get. Just a scroll down. Two fingers. Two fingers. Two fingers. I think I got that. I did sulfurs and then I did. Um, Is it about time to start? What do you think? How's our group? Um, one more question. How do I get back to see who's where? Like this so arrow? this is the toolbar. You click on that. Click on the orange. And I'll bring it out and then you see. And if you want to see questions, just click on this tab down here. Okay. Everybody click on it. See if there's any more. Click on it. Click on the little arrow. Oops, click on the arrow. Uh, and she looks like bottom 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 if you want to talk to anyone, maybe at the end, at the end, maybe just go down and person by person see if they have any questions.
So, oh, you mind when I answer Barb's question about uh, rosacea? Unmute. Unmute. Oh, I can just do that one? Yeah. Barb? Yes? Hi. Hello. Hi. You had a question about the rubrics for rosacea? Yeah, I was wondering what, um, I couldn't follow what you used. Or what so, was used? Yeah, so so under um, acne, it's a subrubric acne and rosacea. I don't know what else Bob used, but there is a rubric. eruption, acne, rosacea. Yeah. Is that, does that answer the question? Is there another question? No, I can't hear you, Barbara. Right. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. How come? I'm going to mute you now. Oh. So, whoops. It looks like another way to Yeah, that's fine. But then, as long as it's red, it goes green. It's right now. If they're red, that means it's not. Uh, if it's red, it's, it's muted. If it's uh, uh, no, not do that. Uh, you want to you want to click on the uh, on the orange. Just click on the orange, and it'll take it away. Okay. All right. I think we should start now. Okay. Attention! Attention! Hello. <laughs> We're going to the ocean. Well, um, good morning, and uh, this is Ananda Kramer, and I'm going to speak to you about Aquamarina, and I'll just give you a little background. Um, it's actually very exciting to me just to discover um, that I have helped someone that would never have been helped if I hadn't attended Dr. Andre Sain's MMPP class and courses, which I've been doing since 2007. And um, I, for me personally, Materia Medica is the, probably the biggest area of study for me to continue. And discovering this remedy was great for me. And I, I am um, going to give you a. I, I just finished this yesterday, so I don't have it for you. So I'll just read it. It's about how it all started for me. Is with a um, client of mine, um, eight-year-old female, who actually I began working with in 2009 when she was two years old, and she had um, some of the symptoms that she had at the time: is quick rise in temper. Um, but then she felt bad about it. She'd hit her two older brothers if they took a toy from her. She was sensitive to noise. Then her, she had. Uh, she was the third child with two older brothers, so she was the baby of the family until her sister was born in 2009 in the summer. And it was very stressful for her. And she would have a lot of acute illnesses, such as cough, ear infections, URIs, she had sluggish stools, athlete's foot, um, kind of common. Common illnesses of a two-year-old. And I was I never felt like I could really find her chronic remedy, and it was I was just going from remedy to remedy, and you know it was an unsatisfying relationship. But I, 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 she was adorable. I would just love it. She'd come in my office and she'd say, "My doctor, my doctor, I want to see my doctor." All very excited. And that made me have a special bond with her. Okay, so now it's 2015, and I get a call from her mother. I hadn't worked with her. There was especially since this was a Portland case, so I had this gap when I moved to the Chicago area. So I hadn't seen or worked with her for a long time. And the mom called me up and said, you know, we need to help her. So it was July of 2015. Now she's seven years old. And uh, you know, it's the older the child, the more you can really see their personality and temperament. So um, here's where her different issues. Uh, preceding this, she had had a measles shot in the spring. Her mother thought that she should have that. Um, she didn't like it, but since then she seemed worse. 
She was upset daily, more explosive, more frequently. Fearful, careful, anxious child. When angry, she would yell at her mother, I hate you, I want to kill you. She would yell, nobody understands me. And she had a lot of fears, and fears that would keep her from doing things. She was conscious of people watching her. Not good at sharing at Girl Scouts when all eyes were on her. If anybody looks at her, she interprets this as negative. This is all from the mom, of course. She doesn't like people to look at her. She cowers or looks back at them with a scowl. She's more agitated or angry or sad if looked at. Her fears, fear of the dark was a 10, going to sleep a 7, bugs 10, dogs 8. If the, uh, not having an adult present in the house or the car was a 9, not being in control a 10, as her mom said, don't we all fear that? Um, she was worried. She'd worried what adult was around, who would be watching the kids if one parent is out and the other is staying, where are other members of the family, who is taking her to school, who is picking her up. She might ask about a family member if they're sick or they got hurt, has asked about dying and has worried that herself, worried about that herself if something bad happens in her sleep and she isn't alive. She doesn't care about her appearance. Her mother calls her a sloppy girl. For example, she'd have food, dirt, and paint on her shirts. Lots of questions. Ask mother questions before falling asleep. Likes mother to lie in bed with her before she sleeps. She'd had no illnesses the past four years um, when I was not in contact with the family. Chilly person uh, from age six to nine, she had to be encouraged to bathe. At five years old, they saw pinworms in her stool. And she was sucking her thumb um, at her time at that time a lot. So I, I was already thinking about the aqua marina, uh, having been introduced to it um, from a class. Let's see, I think it was 2015. It was presented. Um, anyway, so I asked her a few more questions. Um, I asked about how about oceans. You know, was how would her uh, daughter change better or worse with by the ocean? The mom said, "Oceans better. She enjoys getting in and surprised me when we were in Mexico last summer, being thrown around the waves, coming out upset, but getting right back in and enjoying the experience for over an hour." She went back several times in the trip. I asked her about um, a cracked or dried lips. She said none. Um, any sense of hurry? She said, no. She, she, doesn't, she isn't hurried, but she doesn't like to be rushed. And then about the wind. Um, she does not prefer the wind. She'll take shelter under a blanket or car. But the oceans was enough for me to just give it a try, not knowing very much about the remedy. And just the main symptom, really, was um, the not wanting to be looked at. Though it is, aquamarina is in... Um, worms, pinworms, I'm not sure which one, but of course these are with the additions from um, the MMPP project, so this would not repertorize well if you didn't have those additions. So we, we tried her out. Um, she took a pellet of Aquamarina 200C in August of 2015 and then moved to the 1M potency in February of 2016. The last appointment I had with her was in July, so I was able to reach the mother and get an update. But but during this whole time, she was improving all the time. Um, her initial response to the remedy was less fearful, less explosive anger, more confident, more decisive, more grounded, handling social situations better. In February of 2016, for example, she went with friends to homes selling Girl Scout cookies. And these were people, you know, strangers. She went into strange homes, knocking on the door. She didn't know, and she was fine. And even when the dog was barking inside, she was fine. And even there was a, a situation where a, a dog left the house, flew out the door at her, and she was fine. She handled that. She wasn't fearful, and she seemed really natural, the mom said, and still wanted to sell cookies. So the update yesterday, uh, since I hadn't seen her in, since July, and I figured it's because she's doing well, and it was. She, she started the conversation by saying that she almost wanted to say her daughter was cured, 
but she said, you know, no one's perfect, so she's not perfect. So, so, but she did say that she is very solid, amazing how she has changed. She handles herself well, able to deal with fears, massive improvement in anger management. And I think that um, since I didn't really have the time to do the whole case, I did, when I looked at my initial case that I felt like I didn't, really find a remedy for her when she was two. She's, she had that anger piece to stand up to her big brothers. She would hit them. So she still ha she had that anger piece then. And um, it's better now with the aquamarina. So that was pretty, I was pretty jazzed about the power of um, learning these new remedies. And actually aquamarina isn't well represented at all. So it's, it feels like this birth of this remedy to understand and that's We'll see some provings, and anyone who read um, this short presentation, just it's just a synopsis of Aquamarine. It's not the full monograph that was done with the project, but you'll see that there's they're just scattered here and there. I also wanted to let people know if anyone has the Materia Medica uh, by O. A. Julian, Materia Medica of New Homeopathic Remedies. There's a couple pages um, of Aquamarine there. Um, it doesn't, the mentals are not really brought out very well in that, or whatever provings they're using. There is a version to bathing um, in that um, Materia Medica, but the look at does not um, come out. I think that was Sankaran's proving that the wanting to be looked at came out. Did that send him go away with the upper mind for this patient? You know, I. Don't think I ever asked her that directly, actually. But she was more social. She's able, like you said, she's able to go out and sell go stuff with these. And yeah. and have dogs run at her and not be afraid, because that was an eight before. And um, I went through I went through the you know the file I have on her, and the mom just actually you know how they are. When more things are better than they tell you, they weren't better before, but that wasn't on their mind. But. Um, the only thing that I, I wish I'd asked her yesterday, she had an interesting symptom that developed during the time she was taking the remedy, and I don't know if it's still current, is that she refused to take the remedy. So the mom would have to go to her bed when she was asleep and slip the pellet in her mouth. So that lasted at least a year <laughs> that she would. So I should have, I just didn't think about asking her that if that was gone. So refusing to take the remedy, um, I wondered when, you know, this isn't the only, you know, well, not well-known remedy that I've used, and I've kind of wondered, some are some people giving bits of approving to it when they take it for, as a curative? Would that be possible, Dr. Shepard? Well, you know, it's not, we don't, it, I didn't see that in approving that refuses the remedy, but it's curing her, but if, if that is part of the remedy, if that would be showing up as this characteristic of the remedy, if we could use that as part of a proving. I mean, we're not looking at a polycrest here. There's lots missing from this remedy. There's lots missing. Well, uh, Masamalo Mangalari considers it one of his most common remedies. But he lives in, right off the Mediterranean, so and this one is from water from the Mediterranean. But yeah, you can certainly prove it. I mean, if you're responding to a remedy, you can get symptoms of a remedy. How would we know it was a symptom of a remedy? I guess it came and then you didn't get it before it went away. Or... Yeah, I don't know. Have, have any of you heard about that? I mean, it lasted a year, not just one time. Like, I've seen them be and stubborn. And it only came uh, after. Uh, well, we've never given her a medicine. Well, she took pellets when I, I treated her from two to three. And she was fine with them taking remedies. She was raised on taking remedies. They would actually, because there was a family of four, so she'd bring all four children into the office. And if one of her siblings got a remedy, she would want one. So I kept blanks so that I could give everybody a remedy. So that symptom only started after she started responding to Dr. Marina. Apparently. And when I think back about how many remedies she's had in her life. I think you could maybe add it to the repertoire and refuse to take the remedy as a conditional maybe. <laughs> And if someone else confirms they have someone has that symptom and they give them aquamarine and it goes away, yeah. then it could be the one. So, but I've always used the client and the big three and never said the human remedy of the symptoms. Wouldn't you have to ask, though, would that remedy in any circumstances or just your own remedy to 
You're going to be treated to this lullaby. Okay, sorry about that. Anyway, it was, a very, it was very interesting. It does show how stubborn she is. So, um, so um, I just part of what I was thinking about how much is missing from this. So, so then we'll go to some of the things. It's very interesting the history about seawater. I don't think I'm going to read all of this to you. You can read, but some of the things that might generate some interest. Um, because also part of the MMPP project is Sinicula, which is also water. So I've been using that remedy also, which is, an, you know, and so it's the composition of what's in the kinds of water obviously gives a different remedy because they, they all have these minerals, but how this is nothing really like Sinicula. Um, so, you know, just looking at this initial, the, the folks who did this did a really nice job to give the history in medicine about using seawater sea as a treatment and seawater baths that makes sense. And, you know, bathing as a treatment. Sorry, everyone. Where is just, that from? Hmm? This is from, yeah, it's the monograph that the, the um, presenters who studied this remedy okay. gave all this history. At some point, it's going to be available on reference works. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So are Rickenbach and Stutz part of your students? Yes. And do they actually prove it on themselves? Or well, they're, we, they, well, we're going to go. They did a proving. We can maybe go to that. Sorry, my technical skills leave much to be desired. You can tell us I'm doing this. Um, we could go to the poisoning. Let's talk about that because this was very interesting to me. This Clinton. Water? Has anyone ever heard of this Clinton water? Which which um, is seawater, right? Um, that's been packaged in a certain way. It's a cure all. They the this was given in in uh, IVs if they didn't have blood. Um, and people were using it as a as a tonic. Let's see. So many diseases, conditions, particularly gastroenteritis of infants and eczema, uh, eczema, responded to injections of the diluted isotonic ocean water, which could remineralize the sick body, normalize the pH level, and balance the electrolytes, thereby correcting the underlying cause of many disease conditions by regenerating the internal terrain, as Quintin called it. Quintin plasma became very popular as a cure-all before the First World War. Now, what, what I highlighted is from the Hanumanian homeopathic point of view, you know, you it has to fit the case. So, the plasma of Quintin will, only, will cure only when its pathogenesis is closely similar to the patient. All the apparent good that results from its otherwise use um, will turn into harm. The name of the reason and science, in the name of reasons and science, let the advocates of the plasma prove it, as would be done by any other remedy, as the master proved his. Then we shall be pleased to observe its range of action, which we may, may be assured is not as an elixir of life. Furthermore, the writer mentioned some cases of suppression by seawater therapy and concluded the cure of disease is based upon law and the administration of the plasma of Quentin without the light of Similla will bring havoc upon mankind, finally to die out as an ignis fatus. Okay. So I think this is where they would, this is where they talked about during World War I. Um, First World War, they would infuse the seawater and directly into the blood. So it's kind of, it's an interesting. It made me curious about the substance, and so here it is in the uh, monograph that you can go online and buy it today. So, so the I guess the first proving was by Wesselhoff. 
1871. Four provers. These are, all, are provings always so few people? Do you know Dr. Shepard? Out of an that small. Yeah, always that small. And then it was approved by Sankaran in 62. And then. 156? Is that what 156 means? I think that's. Oh, that's a reference. 156 is P. Sankaran. Yeah, oh, the okay. reference was given a different number. I've heard he said okay. that. Yeah, I put the reference numbers at the back. Eight proofs. Yes. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the end of that um, excerpt from the monograph, is that the references so that you could look at it. And then the um, Nelsons made approving, P. Robbins made approving, and then Reckenbach and Stutz, MMPP, made approving. So I think the, the mentals, well, you can, you can see, the mentals seem to come out more with the more modern provings. Because when you see, if Wesselhoff's proving is mostly what's in Julian's, you know, the men mentals are not well developed at all. I would not have uh, found this remedy for this child if, if I hadn't had the, that mental. So that's partly most of what I put in this this excerpt from the monograph is the mentals because that's how I found the remedy. And I don't, I, I mean there are symptoms in all other areas but they don't seem, at least at this point in my understanding of the remedy, that distinctive to you go, oh I know that's aquamarina because this is that, you know, the mentals seem more interesting. I wonder if that has to do, because I'm looking here at the proving of the of Wesson. It says here, uh, proving by Wesson, took a sherry glass full of pure seawater. So they were using the crude substance, basically, versus here they're using it in potency. I wonder if that might be the difference for yeah. aquatic symptoms. Yes. Good thought. Good thought. Okay. So there were 300 entries made to the complete. And um, so that, I don't know how you would find it except on the mentals, I think. And I think that was more clear. I, I chose to give um, Dr. Sain's case because he also presented that at the, um, actually in the case analysis, case management. And it was so clear, especially um, interesting to me is all this MS stuff that I would have been busily looking at and you know it, and you the heart of that case was not all that pathology and that happens sometimes and that's you know especially as you're you know becoming more and more seasoned with the work you know when you're more on the beginner side you know you make you're going repertorizing all those symptoms and looking looking at the disease and I don't think the the mentals were more subtle in that case compared to, to my little girl. If they were that subtle, I wouldn't have found it. Because I think is the insecurity, this core feeling of insecurity is really, I saw that more in um, his patient with the, with the MS. You can, and you can interpret, go, you know, with hindsight I can interpret that um, my little girl was insecure. But insecure, you know, lots of people are insecure. It doesn't point to aquamarina necessarily. So, um, so it was sometimes proving that the delusion is being watched, but um, this is was actually being watched. <laughs> and, um, and, and the little girl that I came away with this for. So, um, it makes sense that you'd, you'd want um, to think about symptoms that remind you of Nat Muir. Until I learned this remedy a couple of years ago, I've often pondered that with people that like, it looks so Nat Muir, but it's not. Um, so now we have something else to look at because we have aquamarina. Core symptoms of insecurity, fear of being watched performing. On the emotional level, there's a delusion of being watched laughed at, fear of being looked at when performing, 
during work and in general dreams of being pursued, feels unprotected and defenseless. Maybe that's why she was always worrying about where the adult was, who would take care of me. You know, she knew she was, um, and that without the adult she felt unprotected and defenseless. Looks like we're cynical. Yeah, insecurity. Ailments. Um, Dr. Burke commented, it looks like our Seneca. But of course, when you what I said about the little girl, it didn't she she wasn't restless now. She did have some restless sleep, but she the anxiety the active anxiety wasn't there, but still reminds you of that. But it's not quite. Um, when feeling disrespected, fear of being abandoned, anxiety in general, shy and reserved. Mentally, the insecurity shows in confusion of mind, dullness, disorientation, weakness of memory for what she has heard memory loss after mental exhaustion, cannot rely on her skills like driving a car, she loses her way. Sensations like losing her ground, like dissolving, or a great desire to escape into a state of formlessness or nothing. Oh, I do because of... No, no, but I do because I'm um, through an astrological or symbolic connection because water is, is Neptune, is is formlessness, is its disintegration of boundaries, it's the oceanic, you know, and it, it seems to be, actually I have another case, I have another uh, person on Aquamarina, and it's just, I'm not presenting that because the jury's out about it's a good fit, but she has that a lot. She can't, feels ungrounded, she's not sure where she is. You're saying they desire that state? Huh? No, they have that state. They have that state of formlessness, I don't sure where I am, where the boundaries. It's that, you know, um, maybe the symbolism has to be if you know enough about astrology and the, um, um, it, it's del delusions and illusions of formlessness or uh, fantasy, being lost in a fantasy world, being taken over by something beyond yourself, um, like a drug state or, you know, getting in a movie, like movies also are kind of uh, Neptunian in that. They're, it's a fantasy pretend world and it, it, you, you've lost touch with grounding and, you know, the mom of my little girl said she's more solid, she kept saying more solid. That was the mom's term. She was more solid, as if she had been kind of spaced out and out there in the, you know, beyond. So like lack of boundaries and stuff like that. that so maybe that's why they're putting the differential phosphorus, because phosphorus can be like that. Yes. Lack of... Um, but how would you look at the rubric thing? Is it she, yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. I, I, and I, I, if I wasn't all hooked up with here, I'd go look. I don't know if they've added it for that. Um, you know, when they were adding the the what came out of the provings that the MMPP did. Okay. Um, sensations of losing your ground, dissolving. That's the word I was wanting too. Because we can dissolve into a movie, we can dissolve into a book, and we're not ourselves. And some people like that escape. I like to escape, but this is not a, a, a good state if you're like driving in my young woman um, that I, I just have the, um, my um, genius of the case that sh you know for her, but I can I can say the last follow-up that she just went to a 1M and she had a three-week aggravation and she just thought she was really losing it, you know, not being able just not being able to drive and so many things like that, like not being able to focus and concentrate, losing focus. She has this um, sadness, melancholy, tearful mood, aggravation, grief, and disappointed in love, ameliorated company. Maybe that's my little girl's wanting to um, have her mom be with her before she went to sleep. Weakness, desire to lie down, aversion to work. I don't think in the mentals. Yes, Bob? So would that be a good way to differentiate against Nation Europe? Does Nation Europe doesn't get familiar with company they like belong? Yeah, that it's could be a point. Um, right? dif differentiate or Nat Muir, ameliorated company. Um, I don't think it's in the 
how, I don't know if any of you read this before. I don't think it's here, but it is an addition that Sane, Dr. Sane made to the, um, the, rub, um, the repertory is um, sensitive to injustice. And I think that um, I'm seeing that in the two cases that I'm working with. It's not strong, strong. I think it's maybe stronger in the child because you know, there's all that sibling rivalry going on. If you're one child of four, and it's, you know, if it's going to come out, it's going to come out in her. It didn't come out so directly, um, but indirectly I could see that that was part of what was a stress from being the baby girl, the, the cute little baby of the family, to being displaced at two years old with a, a cuter baby sister. It's not under jealousy, and it's not under injustice. It's, it's an addition. It's, yeah, it's, it's an addition. addition. It's an addition? Yeah. yeah. I don't have it. No, it's just. That's a 2016 February. Yeah, it's an addition. So it's there. But I don't know if it comes out in this part that I've, I've given you. But there's a lot that is more, it, um, there's more to it than this. But this, I think, is going to give you a, at least a thought in your mind if you see someone like this, could it be Aqua Marina? How would you know? How could you, could you think about it that way? Because it's hard to get the information. So um, I guess the most I could hope today is to just introduce it as a possibility and get you a start on it because unless or until the monographs from the MPP project are ready for purchase, you know, you won't really be able to read all of it. Okay, I'd have to go out of this to look at the entire monograph. I'll, I'll do that. Okay. Because yeah. that wasn't isn't prominent in either of the two cases I'm working with it with, so so I would but doubt in a kid, it. You might not see sensitive right. Sun, right? Right, but the other other client is 32. I hear the genius was worse or better at the seashore. Delusion is being washed and desire solved. When you look up sun. Though there was no genius for this case, it was summary. It says here, it's, it's a desire solved, salty food. It's, so it's similar to nap mirror, but not much about the sun. With, with, there's not much mention of the sun. Yeah, I didn't so think so. Yeah, the sun. Yeah, I didn't so think so. So they don't so. have a sun. Uh, here it says here in her skin. And, uh, in, in the monograph on Aquamarina, an, an old sun cancer scar 26 years ago on her nose got darker than she achieved. So there's really no activation of sun. Yeah, I wouldn't expect that. And more about the tearful mood in that mirror, you know, right by themselves, and they won't be consoled because they have developed an Aquamarina. Yeah. That's true yeah, the alone. I think it has, has both. So I'll look up alone. I think it has both. Prefers to be alone, feels watched in company, even with friends. She always feels eyes on her. She feels observed and is afraid of being laughed at and stand to have an audience. I think mm -hmm. this is from the proving, the more recent proving. Yeah, so she, it actually has both because the little girl would isolate herself. You know, she'd get into a, an altercation with her siblings and they would upset her and she then she'd go off to alone but she wanted her mom you know she always wanted to know where the adult was and she always wanted her mom to lay down with her before bed so that they have both in different situations is that they yeah well but yeah what well, yeah but still eight seven and eight is a little bit old to have your mom lie down with you it's not two or three yeah I mean, the mom had to limit her. I think she want, she would have had her mom there every night for an hour. She said the child would ask her question after question and keep her talking. And, you know, and she would just have to say, I'm going to lay with you for five minutes. But this questioning and talking to her and talking to her before falling asleep, that went away probably after some months on the remedy. She didn't need to ask all those questions and involve her mom. So... Um, I think uh, I guess my my 
feeling just because of the, having these two cases is that there's if there's more to it than we have yet but we've got we got a good start on this remedy and who knows if it'll turn out to be bigger than we think you know maybe it won't be one of those smaller remedies maybe our society is is creating more need for it because of the stresses of modern society I don't know with her, her condition kind of started after an vaccine. I think one of the things people talk about with vaccination injury is brain damage, uh, personality changes, and such. So, you know, it's maybe, you know, in her case, it seems like that's what precipitated her state. Yeah. One of the things that precipitated well, yeah, so Tim's saying the um, vaccination with MMR is precipitated the call. I, the call, for sure, because she was so much worse, so it intensified everything. Right. But my feeling from Childhood, well, I would have never seen this. I don't know if the the big stress I saw was, you know, the birth of her baby sister. She changed a lot after that. So does that mean, uh, that's a question I've had because uh, I tend to have a mother and child practice and it seems like children need different remedies when they're teething and when, and when they're weaning and they're learning to walk and then when they're eight or nine, they're like different people. So I don't know if she needs it then, and I, I would never have seen it, and I didn't even know it existed, or did she change the state with the stress? But the, if she hadn't had the MMR, her parents probably would have said, well, that's just her. You know, we can live with that. But it got so intense, the mom thought that we could do something for her. But I've seen that before, too, in MMR seems to be most difficult in terms of a child's health getting worse after an MMR. If, if they're, especially if they're old enough to really see the personality change. If, if it's two or three, you might not see the personality change as much as an eight-year-old. So, um, and so I picked out some of the, these, I highlighted these just because it was in the case of the eight-year-old girl that she seemed to be um, about the seashore, but the ba bathing. She had that in her case. Um, and, the, and it's an unusual for a mother, I think, to tell, say that, describe her children as messy and sloppy. Usually, you know, you know, she must have been really, you know, not ever wanting to wash her hair and wearing dirty clothes. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's why I asked about the wind. She didn't have a desire to be in the wind. Um, the ground is dissolving. So that is, did we already say that? That's from the new proving, 908. That's the, the new proving. The ground is dissolving. And um, the self-conscious Sensation of being watched as earlier, delusion, fears. I don't, it isn't as direct here that they are angry at being watched, I don't think. It prefers to be alone. She always feels eyes on her. He feels observed and is afraid of being laughed at, can't stand to have an audience. So um, I'm thinking of some other uh, cases that I've been working with about that um, are really um, concerned about approval and how people think of them and like them. And I don't know if, the, if this is too much of an extension or it will, as more cases come out, if that will, this would be an accurate or valid corollary that it's not just um, a fear of being left at or he was constantly obsessed about how she looks. Greatest fear is being an outsider. What's interesting about that one with the, um, the case of the girl that I'm talking about is, is that she kind of went back and forth about that in her family, about you know asking to play with her siblings. Like They didn't really like to play with her so much because she was not a good sport and when things went off and, and against her, she would go off in a huff. So she wasn't really a team player, so they didn't really want to invite her to their games very much. But she asked that she, you know, 
they would say yes. So um, I, I don't know how that, you know, she felt like an outsider and, and she went back and forth in herself about whether she was welcome to play with them or not because she was always excluding herself when things didn't go well. Um, sulking for weeks after being reproached recalls past childhood. I think it's also added in the rubric dwells, but it's not so direct. Would you? Yeah. Yep, it's in the room. So there's that feeling with it. Yeah, I couldn't find any that was a tr trigger in my mind about it because I didn't exactly see why it got added or how it got added. Um, you know, when when um, someone does a monograph on a remedy, they they have cured cases with it, um, which I didn't choose those. I cho chose Dr. Sain's case, even though it wasn't part of the monograph, I don't think, because because of, of the MS and a difficult case, you know, where this was only really a mental issues. It wasn't like a pathology. So that's a good um, comparison. Um, and here the fear something might happen to her daughter, fear of being abandoned. Well, then her fear of things happening to her siblings. I don't think she really had the concentration difficult. It was, it's this other case that I'm working with. Feel, feels very clumsy. Um, this happened in my um, other client's case with her aggravation. She said she was so clumsy, she was cutting and burning herself, like with cooking, just repeatedly. So uh, I suppose if this isn't the similimum, it could have been approving of it, but she was reflecting the remedy. Obviously the remedy was, was happening for her, and she was really upset, of course, because she couldn't understand why she was becoming so clumsy. And I just said, wait, wait, you know, and then just at the edge, three weeks, the edge of her tolerance, she said, she woke up the next morning and she's better. Everything's better. She feels great. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. But that's what we went to the, with the 1M. And that was in water. Wow, she had to make three weeks. Yeah, five dilutions. Five cups. <clears throat> yes. She did, and she aggravated for three weeks. Kids like that, she grew up in Montana when you beat the running. Exactly. Kids like that, that aggravated for five and a half weeks, and she was better for five years. Oh. So when they aggravate a long time like that, yeah. Maybe so, you've got a good run, and then they improve everything. And so, this, so, so Tim's saying um, with that long of an aggravation, they might improve for a long time. And you said a case of aggra someone aggravated for... In a case, she aggravated for five and a half weeks, and one dose five and half weeks. Long, 1,500 by mile, and every symptom she'd ever had came back. And she was not right. very happy. I don't know if the group can hear you, though. And then after... Uh, yeah, she came in at six weeks, and she was just starting to improve, and she was better for like five years. So with one dose. <laughs> one dose of NUX. Yeah. Every old symptom came back. Every old symptom. Five and a half weeks. And, and she came back at week six and weeks. she said, I'm just starting to improve. Started to improve at week six and then she was good for five years. Five years. Wow. How many digits is that? 200 by mouth. Wow. 200. One dose. One dose. Nux, one dose. Interesting story because then I saw the daughter and I gave the daughter an amnion and said, give it in water. She didn't. And the daughter had four blood pressure. She ran away from home. <laughs> So why did you do that and put it in water? But here you're getting it five cups and still. <laughs> yeah. Just as they're saying, maybe I should have done ten, but I was thinking, God, she didn't take a pellet. <laughs> that was a five cups, um, yeah, little, little quarter teaspoon of five cups, and she aggravated for three weeks. But it. What made you do the dilution so dilute? Because she was, no. you know, she was, she was taking. The remedy too often, I thought. Let's see if I can get her. Screenshot. Is that how visible is that? This is her case. It doesn't look very clear, is it? So this is this is her case that we're talking about. So. Who is that? Right. 
And in the middle. That's Arsenica, the second one? Mantinella, Pulsatilla, Mantinella, Alpha Marina. Okay, okay. Well, I can ex make it. There you go, right there. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So um, she had the dry chapped lips, want of self confidence, better jogging and dancing, drops things, not cut herself. <laughs> Worse sense of um, head injury, version to be alone. What is this? Fearful and sad when alone, desire. I think the read is cut off for me too. There. Company aversion too, aggravates. Better alone, anxious and fearful and sad when alone. Company, desire for company while alone, aggravates. She had both actually when I questioned her. When she was upset, she wanted to be alone, but she said if she was alone, that made her worse. <laughs> um, so this is this is my genius. Where is the Apple Marina? It's in the middle, just to the right of the middle. Right there. Yeah. Pulse now I can see it. Awesome. Uh, self confidence. Um, so it's a three and one of self confidence. One with better jogging and dancing, dropping things. Nothing, head injury, nothing. That, I was having a theory that she, um, because she seems so much worse since this head injury, but maybe it wasn't useful. Um, uh, I think it just hasn't been added to the repertory for dropping things. I looked at awkwardness, dropping, it wasn't there. But that's probably just the person who did the monograph hasn't added it to the repertory yet. Okay. Someone steer me back to the thought that had me pull this up. Oh, it's your question about um, why the cups. Okay. Um, she, she was under a lot of stress with her work. And she was taking it at the 200 C every 10 days, sometimes five days, four days. And she um, was a lot worse. And I couldn't really convince her that she was taking it too much and it was hard to see. I mean, I don't know if other people have had that experience when someone's under stress. They can't, they don't know where they're coming and going. So they, they feel bad, they take a dose, but then they feel bad so quick, they take another dose, but really they could be taking too much and that's why they feel worse and they get very confused. So I, I felt that she was very confused and that she was a lot worse with her stress. But she had to work 14 days straight. They had a working, um, no weekends off. So I felt like she was overdosing and so I was wanted to be careful with the 1M because I felt like she was over the top with remedies. That's why. And um, it was a good thought. Um, so mostly though um, I had in mind my, the, the little girl that I first brought you the case about how much they were alike. If I was for a, an adult woman about 32 or 33, I feel like she had a lot in common with the little girl in terms of if things don't go well for me, then I don't want to play. I think that was kind of this way she is at work. Like she's trying to fit in and she's trying to take care of things, and then they wanted to do a certain way or if they won't listen to her, then she has a lot of trouble participating and being with them because she's got so much upset inside. So it was more about that. So she, because she doesn't have the looking at, though, she is a, um, I don't know if it'll come out that there's a positive side of that of wanting to look good too, because she's, she's um, always, you know, meticulously turned out. So there is something about her appearance and, and the old, older woman. Um, I have I have this sheet. I want to look more at the mentals. That's mostly I plan to stress the mentals because I think at this point, without it being in most people's repertory, you have to just be thinking about the personality and thinking, could it be this? Um, there's something about appearance. I'm not going to find it now. Um, 
Should I leave this up or go back to the monograph? Is there any questions about this? This is just a, a sketchy uh, in-process case, but I feel like this is a remedy in process, and I'm very interested in um, sharing my experience and other people then sharing their experience if they try it, and especially because it's also got skin symptoms, Bob. Yeah, I've never, I've never used that remedy, and I'm so glad you talked about it because um, I don't know anything about it. Where do you buy your aqua marina actual remedy from? Because I don't think we're going to have that. Um, actually, I, I bought it from um, Dr. Sane's office. Oh. I don't know. I mean, I shouldn't say that. I mean, we don't. We, poor, poor Leslie will be in the business of, just like Jan, selling remedies is a lot of work. But you know, it's it's not it's not that easy. I just checked out Amazon, and it says Aquamarine um, Pregnancy and Dehydrated. But yeah, few, uh, for thirty is maybe easy, but you know, one M, ten M. Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it exists above a ten M. So, I mean, that's a good start with skin, isn't it, Bob? So, yeah. I could use a 30 easy, but um, going up the potency. As I looked at the um, Center for Integral Health office today, or yesterday, and I did not see even a drawer for it. There's no place for it. He thought he did, but I don't know where he would have gotten it because the office doesn't have even a spot for it. It's not like there's a name and empty. It's like there's no name. Oh, I don't know. I didn't check that. Good point. No. So, I mean, who could use it? That's why it's so exciting about the MMPB. I mean, it's like everybody support it. Work it. You know, go to the classes. Help them. Yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting. It's just to see I mean, you know, homeopathy isn't 200 years old. It's now. I love it. You know, we're, and that's what Andre's doing for us. This is his brainchild. I can remember, I didn't go the first year. Uh, I didn't know about it. So the second year I went there, he had a plan. He was going to present all these remedies in five years. I mean, you know, and, and until he started looking, did he realize it's a complete overhaul? Or let's put it the other way, it's a research project for all this material that's there in journals for all 200 years that no one knows about and adding it to a Materia Medica. It's, it's, so, it's such a big project. Now he's, I don't know how many people are doing it, but many, many people. He was going to do this himself in five years, about 200 remedies or something, but no idea until he opened the box to see what was there. A lot of work. And it's pretty, it's, and when, you know, as I said, when I just start to help someone that you would never have helped because of this work. It's interesting. I always thought that it was, I had heard that it was a new remedy, and I thought maybe uh, Maslow and Maslow Gori maybe thought of it or something like that. Because I know he's made it pretty popular. And then when I saw that Russell had did it like in the 1800s, like, wow, this isn't like a new age kind of a remedy. This has been around a long time. It just isn't really that well Right. And I think there's there's a lot of them like that. But even ones that people think that are well known, like conium, um, that that has been huge. The monographs um, just keep getting bigger and bigger. What you know, so so some of ones that are sort of dusty on the shelf that haven't been taken off to see what they can do, and some of them are ones we think we know, but there's so much more to it than we realize, and then the, then they get very uh, complex personalities. <laughs> think of remedies as people. There we all have so many sides. Like the, I, I think in my early days I always wondered how the why it has the polarities. You know, there's like. Aquamarina, they want to be alone, but they kind of want company. There's like both sides. Like, how how do you understand that, Dr. Shepard, about the polarities and remedies? Okay. So 
Okay. So the Dr. Shepherd was saying but polarities uh, yeah. are not opposites to complements. You know, like you can't have a north I think that that's important. Uh, Dr. Shepard first said that you could look at it as stages, like the sepia indifference comes at a later stage of the of the pathology or the illness or the weakness of the person, or or the um, polarities rather than opposites. Complementary. Sorry, I said polarities. Complements rather than opposites, and. Um, that's really helpful because I think when I think of them as opposites, I think how could there has to be one? One is right and one is wrong versus complementary. You can have both at the same time. What about primary and secondary action? So I would say there were only four remedies that have the opposite symptoms in the primary. They showed brown your rust toxin. Um, so, otherwise, there are, there are you know, the opposites could be primary and secondary. Okay. So, the opposites, op, well, what you're going to call complementary, can be primary and secondary? In that case, you wouldn't call them complementary. Well, so it's a, different people use different methods. So, um, it says alternating. Alternating. Primary. And secondary. So, it's polar opposites. Okay. That was a little question that I had. If anyone else, maybe I should look to see if anyone else has some questions right now. Maybe we'll bring up a little bigger point, bigger, wider problem to me. You know, when you look at the original remedies that were proven, very few of them are complex minerals. Turquoise was a very minerally common remedy because every mountain, like granite, say, Mountain is a different percentage of the components. So then proving something like granite or sandstone or whatever, you have to have exactly the same sample. So the same thing to me applies to seawater. Depends how cold it is, how hot it is, how much minerals mm -hmm. are, where it's located. You put the same body of water, the depth and the temperature and the currents that day, whether it stirred up the, the sand from the bottom. Rain recently, there's, there's so many variables of the ingredients that the original guys who did brewing they didn't use complex materials because of, they're not standard. There's no standardization. Mm. So if they're going to get a better proving of aquamarine, it has to be exactly the same sample over and over again. So if Senator and got it from the ocean outside of India somewhere, they got it from the Mediterranean, and that's totally different substances. Okay, so Dr. Shepard's making a point uh, on complex materials like water, which would be the same as be for Sinicula, it's water. Of course, the water's gone now, but you'd have to do the same sample over and over. Same location, same yeah, spot, yeah. how much, how same deep, spring. how, how you know, low, where it's colder, top, you know, because you get some plankton. That's one thing about um, the, the Quinton. Is plankton in it, the sample? Or they can use the same remedy and just keep grafting it from the same guy, you know? Like yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you'll get inconsistent. Yes. You no, know, certainly we need, you know, how many, how common is an appetizer yes. or anything in our population and how many variations of it we see that are exactly net near. Still works, but we need, we need things that are close to net near. Like yes. So here in the room, we're, we're having a discussion about standardizing the raw material that we're proving. And, um, you know, in the part of the monograph I sent you, you know, there was the, if they, the plasma quintin has uh, significantly higher plankton me metabolic secretions than seawater taken from outside a plankton vortex. Now, we don't know what, what water Wesselhoff proved. They just say pure seawater. Sankaran, uh, you said you know that Sankaran was Mediterranean? No, I don't know. Okay. Well, 1962 proved by P. Sankaran with Aquamarina 30C from Nelson's London. 
made from Quentin's marine plasma. So that's what he proved. He had eight provers. Um, now, P. Robbins in 1999 made two blind provings, um, but do they say what he used? Uh, Robbins provings, it, um, second proving. they didn't, uh, pharmacy not mentioned, so we don't know where they got their remedy from. <clears throat> And um, Robin's proving is part of radar in complete repertory 2012, not in complete 4.5. So the, um, the authors of this monograph said, first, we did not want to include Robin's proving in this work because the majority of symptoms are related to moods and dreams. Yet after careful study of this very transparent proving, we included symptoms that appeared during the first days after taking the remedy. So the proving made by Reichenbach and Stutz, uh, I'm going to see what, what they say where they got their remedy. They don't say. Said so five provers participated. First one dose 30C, second day no remedy. One dose a day till symptoms appeared. That would be a good question to know where the what exact substance. Right, right. And the substance like this is definitely needed. You have to know exactly the source. You know the source. You have to worry about it even in plant species. They have a relatively stable dynamic no matter where you're grown. But I mean, it's very specific what time of the year you should pick it, what parts you should pick. I mean, what if you take your little dandelion that's an inch tall from between the cement? Concrete in the sidewalk, and I take the dandelion growing in my way, so again, the garden is 18 inches tall, beautiful color. Are they going to have the same proving? So, you know, this is all work that needs to be done. Yes, so knowing our source, and that, that's not here in this monograph. Like, we don't know if they used, but we do know what Wesselhoff, we don't know, we can't ask him, but that um, Sankaran used. The one made from Quinton's marine plasma. It's a four, oh, it's a DM. Like I, I get C's, but what's a DM? Five hundred. C is a hundred, and you know, just going up the scale, DM is five hundred. Yeah, five hundred thousand. M is a thousand. So you got one M, ten M. 50 amps. So that's DM. Okay, I just, because this, um, I was just trying to figure out where you could get the aquamarina from, and um, pretty much everything that's pulled up says it's not available, but someplace in West Virginia has WHP. Um, it says that they've been there since 1873. They start 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, seeds all the way up to 30C, and then it says 2DM, 4DM, and it says 1 ounce, 2 ounce. Oh, dram. 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 A dram is like a, like a, a Oh, it's not a potency you're talking about. It's like a dram with the size of Oh, dram. Yeah, because that wouldn't make sense to skip up to there when... Yeah, that yeah. doesn't make sense. It's so, like you so, want to do like every increment of the seeds and then jump to... So, someone here in the room is looking to see a source for aquamarina. It's not that easy to find. I guess Nelson's has it. I'm just trying to have the webinar participants know what we're talking about here. Right, but then I'm asking which source of our Yeah. Yes. So um, that that's an interesting point that came to light. Important point with new. Developing remedies. I won't say this is a new remedy that Bob pointed out. Weisselhoff, Weisselhoff did it um, some years ago, many years ago, but it's it's almost new because we don't know much about it in terms of practice. Oh, yeah, this one's really good. Uh, let's see. What's it? Uh, let's see. Did he say? Seven. Um, Seven. 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 Seven
And <laughs> it's funny, he doesn't say it. And the yeah. thing from 1872, uh, well, he lived in Boston. He lived in Boston. Well, he didn't say are there any questions for our webinar participants or something that you're missing? I'm not sure I'm giving you everything that's being talked about in the room. Um, and Tim is gone, so I'm doing the webinar controls with lots of fumble, so bear with me. Um, Thank you so much for giving us the one from OA June, and that's really cool. I mean, this, there's a fair amount of stuff in there. Yeah, I, I figured we'd have to take a lot of sources and put it together. Yeah, no, this is this has a lot to it. I mean, because if you look at the one that um, 1872 one from Russell House, there's not much there. I mean, when he said fragmentary proof, he meant fragmentary. So the, the OA June really has a lot more stuff in it. So that's really thank, I'm thankful that you brought that to us. That's cool. And, and anybody who has a Materia Medica library might have it. There's have it just directly from the book. Um, that I didn't send out because I wasn't savvy enough to. I tried to scan it, but it didn't work. So I could see if my photographs are re readable. That's what I felt it wasn't very readable. So if anyone wants to email me. I can, I can give, give you that. So, uh, questions. I'm looking in the question box. Do you see any questions? No questions, at least. Are people signing off? Everybody saying good? No questions? So, we want to. We're finished? I think we're well, finished. Before we end the webinar, let's just remind people the next meeting is you can tell them. Let's see, one time. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Saturday, March 18th. Saturday, March 18th. 2017. Next year. Same time. Yep. Same station. Yes. Next year, we meet again. So we have a lot of holidays. Happy holidays. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year. <laughs> happy Kwanzaa. Anything else? Diwali. Diwali. Happy Diwali. Yo, Diwali is great. So, um, I guess it's time to leave the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.